Hello folks, my name is Paul Hargrove and on behalf of the entire Pagoda team here, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's UPC++ tutorial. On the title slide, it's on your screen right now, you'll see a URL uh, that gives access to not only these slides, but the hands-on exercises, uh, complete versions of the code snippets that will appear on the slides. Uh, and uh, I or one of my assistants will shortly paste that into the Zoom chat window as well, so you have it. Uh, it'll also appear again when we get to the hands-on later in the year. With those things out of the way, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Amir Kamil. Thank you, Paul. So I'd like to start just by um, acknowledging everyone who has contributed to this project, including our collaborators, our team members, our funding agents, and of course, NERSC and ECP for uh, providing resources and hosting for this tutorial. So before we get to the details of the EPC++ system, um, I want to discuss some motivating applications in terms of, you know, why sort of um, more commonly used um, programming models aren't, um, aren't well suited to do certain applications. So in particular, what we're looking at are applications that have irregular data structures or irregular communication patterns. So things like sparse matrix methods where the number of non-zeros is irregular. Um, algorithms like adaptive mesh refinement where the grid resolution was actually different at different uh, places in the, in the grid domain. And also problems that are inherently irregular like graph problems or distributed hash tables. So all of these algorithms involve um, applications sending different amounts of data between different processes. And that amount of data can, can actually be uh, something that depends on runtime data in terms of how much to communicate between different processes. So along with application trends, we also see some system trends that are actually contributing to um, sort of more fine, fine grained messages. With exascale systems, we see that um, often the case is that the memory per core is dropping, especially on things like uh, Xeon Phi systems or accelerator systems. And so this means that um, rather than storing things, rather than replicating things in memory everywhere, um, oftentimes applications need to do more communication instead. So again, we have these machines are getting larger as they're getting larger latency is dropping much more slowly than um, than other features such as bandwidth. And so applications that use fine grained communications essentially the latency term becomes more and more dominant. And so essentially what we need to do both on um, both because of application trends as well as because of system trends, we need to reduce communication costs. And there's there's two different sort of aspects of communication that um, that we're trying to address. The first one is that we need to have first class support for asynchrony. So the ability for applications to launch off an operation and then do something else while that operation is happening. The, the other piece that we're trying to address is just to reduce the overhead term. So reduce the amount of overhead that a fine grained message actually pays for in terms of the, the library itself. So as you all know, the dominant model for, um, for communication on large scale systems is message passing. Message passing is two sided in that both the sender and the receiver need to coordinate in order to transfer a message. And what this means is that the metadata is actually split up between the initiator and, and, and the receiver and the underlying system actually has to do the matching. Along with that, um, because of the fact that you have the sender and receiver that are both participating in the communication, there's an inherent synchronization also involved when you do a data movement. Um, and again, the library has to do some matching underneath the hood in order to provide the ordering guarantees that are semantically um, guaranteed by the model. These guarantees aren't actually a good semantic match for actual hardware systems. Network hardware is generally speaking unordered at, at the lowest level. There are multiple paths, generally speaking, between the sender and the receiver. And if different messages take different paths but need to be reordered at the receiver, then there is a cost to do that in the in the runtime library. So our goal is to reduce these overheads by changing essentially the model. So we we do 
a one-sided model that avoids the need to match um, the source and the target. We relax our ordering guarantees. And we also, again, reduce the overhead in the library so that there are fewer instructions to do a fine grained communication operation. So specifically, the way we do this is through one-sided communication where the initiator provides all the metadata and there isn't any required matching that, uh, that the receiver needs to participate in. So again, this means that we don't need to match up sends with receives. We don't need to guarantee message ordering. And also there aren't unexpected messages in the sense that you know, we don't have a sender send off a message to a receiver that's, that isn't expecting it. In which case the sort of the runtime library would need to figure out what to do with that. Okay, because all the metadata is provided by the initiator, um, we don't actually need to pay the cost for that um, for that matching. As a model, this kind of looks like shared memory, and we'll get, go into more details in terms of the partition global address space model that that is being used here. But sort of the key observation is that this is a really nice match for the underlying hardware provided by modern networks. So in particular, modern networks generally um, provide random, uh, sorry, provide remote direct memory access so that you can actually have an initiator do a put or get to some remote processor's memory without actually involving the CPU on the remote side itself. And Another nice thing about this model is that if the target is actually it actually shares memory with the initiator, then this doesn't have to go through the network at all. So it can be compiled down to just a load and store. Whereas in the message passing model, even in that case, um, essentially the programmer needs to explicitly uh, program so that it, um, you know, essentially put explicitly put in a condition on their code to check whether or not the sender and receiver are local. Whereas in the case of RDMA, that sort of can get handled by the, by the runtime. All right, just to provide some real numbers to back up um, sort of uh, the benefits of our, perform our, our programming model as well as the underlying uh, communication library that we use. So we use GasNet EX. Um, and even with respect, even in comparison to MPI3, which actually does provide um, one-sided communication, we see that GASNET EX um, provides significant performance benefits. So this graph over here um, shows latency numbers on four different systems with three different MPI implementations and two distinct uh, network hardware types. Um, the Cori systems are using the Aries network and then the other two systems are using InfiniBand. And we see that in all cases, for both puts and gets, get, GASNET EX um, provides better performance and sometimes significantly anywhere between uh, five to 55 percent. If we look at bandwidth numbers, we see a similar story, particularly sort of in uh, medium sized mess messages. At the top, we have um, GasNet EX. So uh, this red one with the X's is GasNet EX Git, and the one below that is MPRRMA, and you see that there is actually a performance improvement. And similarly speaking, when it comes to puts. Okay, and again, we see similar uh, characteristics on other systems as well with medium-sized messages, GasNet EX providing better performance. To, to, what, extent, to what extent does this uh, rely on a high-performance interconnect? versus let's say a heterogeneous you know, gigabit, uh, gigabit or 10 gigabit network. So I'll defer to the guest net folks to actually I'm, answer yeah, that I'm question. sorry, I'm jumping too many, I didn't hear yeah. the entire question. No worries, so to, to what extent do these results depend on a, a high-speed interconnect versus let's say a you know, 10 gigabit ethernet? Um, so we certainly don't tune for something like 10 gigabit ethernet. Our funding is all from the same folks that buy these right. multi-million dollar HPC machines. Uh, that said, for a standard Ethernet network, uh, you know, lossless switched Ethernet, uh, we use UDP underneath, where MPI typically uses TCP. So the reduction of some of those overheads does mean that we see some reduction in latencies. Uh, I think that for the high speed, uh, especially 100 gigabit, um, we're very badly tuned in terms of the 
our buffers aren't appropriate for the bandwidth delay products for those. But it's really not, it's not the area we, we tune in. So I wouldn't be here to tell you what these, I could not speculate what these would look like if I compared MPI and uh, GasNet or, or UPC++ plus on a 100 gigabit network. On a 10 gigabit, it's, I guess they're probably pretty comparable. Okay. Thank you, Paul. So just to demonstrate that um, we see similar things when it comes to the UPC++ level, where again, we're building on top of the GasNet BX library or in C++. Um, but we see similar characteristics comparing um, micro benchmarks that are written in UPC++ versus MPI RMA, where we have um, lower latency for medium-sized messages as well as higher bandwidth. What's the what's happening in that? So the question was, is that a protocol switch or why is this happening? The, the wiggles there are the, the kinks. Uh, I didn't directly collect that data, so I'm not recalling precisely what the MPI one was, but um, I do believe that, yeah, that's definitely a protocol. So in the left-hand figure, the kink in the yellow line, our data, that is a protocol switch, correct? I do not know. I assume that the MPI one is probably also a protocol switch, uh, or that may just be the point where it exceeds one network flip. It may just be a transition from a single flip to, to two flips. So essentially, the the latency and and bandwidth numbers justify our choice of GasNet EX, and we'll also see that um, uh, momentarily that there are other aspects that, that GasNet DX provide us. Um, particularly when it comes to things like active messages that motivates, motivate us using it as opposed to uh, directly using MPI3 RMA. Um, as far as the, the programming model, so this idea of, um, of actually direct remote memory access at the, at the program level is called uh, PGAS or Partition Global Address Space. And what this means is that we support the ability of remote processes to actually directly access memory on, on other processes. We also distinguish between private and shared memory, and we'll get into more details on that later. And one important aspect is that we separate the synchronization from the data movement. So again, a, a remote put or a get doesn't, um, given the hardware RDMA capability doesn't actually involve the remote CPU, and so therefore it doesn't actually involve a, a synchronization. Uh, the benefit of course is that, you know, we get better performance. We can amortize the cost of a synchronization if we need one over many transfers. Of course, this also means that um, if a program needs an actual synchronization, then it has to ask for one explicitly. So this isn't a new model. PGAS languages and libraries have existed for over 20 years at this point. But in what we're focusing on, on is UPC++, which is a C++ library that implements this model. Okay, and our goal is to provide a low overhead implementation that can interoperate with, with existing applications. Before I get into more detail on PGAS, I just want to give a brief overview of our execution model. So PGAS is the memory model. It's what allows individual processes to actually do one-sided access to the memory owned by other processes. This is orthogonal to the actual execution model, which is, you know, what do the processes actually run? How, do, how does the code actually look like? So the model that we adopted is the same model that's typically used in MPI, which is single program, multiple data. Each of the processes run the same program image, but they don't run it in lockstep. Okay, so they synchronize at various synchronization points like barriers, but otherwise, they run their code independently. So here we have a simple example of a UPC++ Hello World program. Like with MPI, you start by initializing the library and then each process proceeds in, again independently to execute the, um, these print statements over here. Then a barrier does synchronizes all the processes. It 
prevents anybody from moving forward until all the processes have reached it. So that is actually a synchronization point. And then in this particular program, we have process zero do another printout. And because of the barrier synchronization, we're guaranteed that that printout will happen after you know, all the previous printouts have happened. Okay, but there isn't any ordering in terms of the printouts before the barrier. And then finally, just like with MPI, um, the application um, needs to close down the library with a call to finalize. Again, this is the, the core model adopted by UPC++. There are other PGAS systems like um, Chapel and X10 that adopt a different execution model. Uh, but ours is sort of what would be more familiar to MPI programmers. I will mention a forward reference. We do augment this model with the remote procedure calls, which is a key feature of UPC++, and we'll come back and talk about that momentarily. All right, so before we do that, though, more details in terms of the PGAS model and sort of the specific aspects of it that UPC++ provides. So the memory on each process is divided into the private segment for that process, which only that process can access. And then the shared segment for that process as well, which is now accessible by other processes as well. The combination of all the shared segments across the processes, we refer to that as the global address space. And it is partitioned, as we can see physically amongst the different processes, but also within the programming model itself, we make a distinction between things that are local to a particular process that are actually accessible through just uh, direct um, loads and stores versus those that are not local that need to go um, through the network. For, in terms of representing uh, memory that's in the actual global address space, we have um, an abstraction of a global pointer. And a global pointer, again, it can actually be referring to something that's in the same processes shared segment because that's part of the global address space. But it can also be, uh, it can also refer to something that lives in the shared segment of another process. So a bit more detail on global pointers. With a raw pointer, we just have, with, with just a native C++ pointer, we just have a memory address. But with a, raw, with a global pointer, we have a combination of a memory address as well as um, an owner. You know, the process that actually created that, um, that, that, that allocated that memory. So, oh, there. so in this picture down below, we've represented local raw C++ pointers as these thin black arrows, whereas global pointers are represented by uh, thicker red arrows. And we can see that we can have a global pointer that actually points to some memory in, on the, in the shared segment of some other process, or you can have um, a global pointer that actually points at some location that's in your own uh, portion of the global address space. And we will see later that we do ha actually have mechanisms for querying the affinity of a particular global pointer, which again is refers to the process that um, that allocated the underlying memory. So the specific way that we actually represent a global pointer in UPC++ is through a template. A raw C++ pointer is parameterized um, by, the, by the actual data type. Now, of course, for native C++ pointers, we have specific syntax for that, something like a double star. For us, because we're a library, we sort of have to rely on the mechanisms that C++ provides us, which is templates. Okay, so we represent the global pointer with this global pointer template. In this case, we have our, our object type is, is double. And again, this global pointer carries both the, the raw memory address as well as the affinity, uh, the process that actually created that object. Okay, so I think there were two different questions. There's the first question is, does a global pointer live in the private memory of a process? And it can live in the private memory, but it can also live in the shared space as well. And actually in this particular picture, we see that we have some global pointers that live in the private space, maybe as stack variables, for instance. But we can also have uh, global pointers that live in, in the shared space as well. So in this particular case, essentially what this is illustrating is a linked list that crosses uh, multiple shared segments. 
Um, the second question you had was about, you know, if you allocate, if you have a global pointer, is that replicated amongst the different processes? So not by default. Uh, essentially, we'll see that we provide a mechanism for allocating memory in the shared space, which gives you back a global pointer. And then if you want other processes to have access to that global pointer, you have to communicate with. All right, so a global pointer is a representation of memory that lives potentially somewhere else. In order for that to be useful, we also need to couple that with some mechanisms for actually transferring um, the memory. And one of the things that, you know, I'll mention now, it's not directly in the slides, but, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's worth noting, is that for a raw C++ pointer, you just do a dereference to actually access the underlying memory. But one of the key design principles in EPC++ is that we don't want communication to be hidden. Uh, because that, you know, can lead, that is likely to lead, lead to non-performant code. So what we do instead is, in UPC++, we actually provide um, function templates for, for doing memory transfers. So in this particular case, if we look down here, we have our git, which does a one-sided git operation from, uh, from some remote memory, and then we also have our put, which does a one-sided put. So in this particular case, if we assume that this middle CPU is actually running this code over here, and we assume that uh, G pointer one is pointing at this object in the shared segment of the processor on the right, that our git, again, it does the one-sided transfer. It doesn't actually involve, um, assuming that the underlying network hardware supports RDMA, it does not actually involve the remote CPU. And then similarly, if we assume that uh, the second global pointer is on that left-hand CPU over there, once again, the R put, assuming that the underlying network hardware supports it, does a one-sided transfer um, from, the, from the middle CPU to the left one. So we refer to this, this model as remote memory access. And just you know, to clarify a distinction, we talked about RDMA, and now we're talking about RMA. RDMA is a network hardware feature, whether or not the network hardware actually supports one-sided access at the network layer. RMA is the programming model. And you don't necessarily need to have, you know, one to have the other. If you have UPC++, for instance, run over, say, uh, the UDP conduit, then it's not actually making use of RDMA, but the programming model is still one-sided. And, you know, on the other hand, if the network hardware does support RDMA, then you can imagine programming models that don't make use of that um, through one-sided access. Okay, so just to clarify, RMA is a programming model. RDMA is a feature of the network hardware. All right, so these one-sided, um, these functions for moving um, data in a one-sided manner, again, just move data. We also provide a remote procedure call, which allows the movement of both computation and data as well. Okay, and in particular, these two features essentially are the core um, programming abstractions provided by UPC++. We, again, we have one-sided remote memory access that's low overhead, both because you know, we're taking full advantage of um, C++'s template mechanisms in order to minimize the overhead in, in the UPC++ library itself as well as making use of GasNet EX and taking advantage of all the great work they've done to, to optimize these transfers. And then we also have remote procedure calls, which again, allow the movement of both computation and data to some other process. I mentioned that our design principles are to encourage performant design. So this is for instance, why we don't actually provide um, remote transfers through the standard dereference operator, okay, because that would encourage non-performance um, programming. So all communication is syntactically explicit through functions like rput and rgit. Also another core idea in UPC++ is that everything is asynchronous. If I actually just go back for a second over here, you can see that there are actually these wait calls over here. Okay, because what rgit and rput actually give us back is not the result of that transfer, it's a proxy for it, something that we refer to as a feature that will become ready at some later point. And the wait call is what we need to do to actually ensure that um, that, that transfer has completed. 
So again, all of the communication operations in UPC++ are asynchronous. And by default, they provide you back a feature that actually represents um, the feature completion of the result. We also designed the library to be built around scalable data structures. And so what that means is that essentially data structures that um, don't necess that are sublinear uh, on a per process basis. So that way, if you have a very large computation, say 100,000 uh, processors, we don't need, you know, um, 100,000, we don't need internal data structures that scale um, linearly. So this is both true of the internal uh, runtime in terms of the EPC++ um, internal data structures as well as the GasNet EX data structures beneath them, but it's also true of the abstractions that we provide to the user as well. Later on, we'll see um, distributed object, which is essentially a mechanism for representing some a distributed data structure uh, and is designed in a, such a way as to avoid uh, full replication. Um, so again, uh, sublinear scaling. Questions so far? Yeah. So sorry if I missed it because I had to step out for a moment, but are the, are the features ever executed yearly or is, um, or do you have to manually uh, make progress happen? So that's a good question. The question was, are, are the features executed eagerly or do you actually have to manually invoke progress to make that happen? So later on, we will actually talk about the progress model for UPC++. We won't go into every nitty gritty detail. There are, we do provide mechanisms for, um, for essentially asking for some eager evaluation. And we are considering actually um, adding more mechanisms for that in the library. Any C++11 compliant uh, compiler will work with UPC++. As we mentioned, we rely on GasNet EX for providing the low overhead communication. Uh, but one of the core things about GasNet EX that isn't provided by other uh, communication libraries is the concept of an active message. Um, so not just memory transfers, but the ability to actually uh, execute some piece of code on some remote process. And so this is, one of the core abstractions we actually use to, um, to support RPCs and would be uh, much more difficult and more expensive to implement in other models. And GasNet EX does the hard work of being portable across different machines. In fact, um, from laptops to supercomputers, you can run uh, the UPC++ examples with GasNet on your own machine, as well as for those of you who are in the room, and have signed up for a query training account, you'll also be able to run it on supercomputer as well. Now we designed the library um, to support interoperation. So this is why we chose C++ rather than building our own compiler. It's also why we chose the, the SPMD programming model because that's sort of the core programming model um, used in most MPI programs. Um, so it's relatively straightforward to actually build applications that make use of both um, UPC++ and MPI, and we have users who have done that. Um, we'll talk about, we'll talk briefly about the threading model for um, within our processing in UPC++ later, but we've designed it in such a way that it uh, composes with essentially any threading library, including OpenMP, um, including CUDA or whatever your favorite um, shared memory library is. All right, before we get into some more detailed UPC++ examples, um, again, I just want to emphasize sort of, you know, two of our core features that make UPC++ um, efficient and make it, um, essentially make it a good choice for irregular applications. So as I mentioned, um, Everything is asynchronous by default. So what this means is that when you actually do a communication operation, there's the initiation of the operation and then there's a wait for the, for the operation to complete. And these two things um, are distinct, okay? So before we saw that when we did an R get, we immediately did a wait, but that's not the typical way you would actually write a UPC++ program. Uh, more typically, you would do the R get, you get back, uh, a future which we'll talk about in more detail uh, momentarily. And then you could do some other communication operations or some computation and then do the wait at the end.
And this is what will actually um, will block for completion of that operation and then uh, return that result. Okay, so the other sort of um, core novel feature that we provide is remote procedure call. So we the initiator launches an RPC that um, targets some other process. The, the first argument is actually the target process. The second argument is the actual function to be executed. And that can be just a regular C++ function, or it can actually be, as we'll see in many examples, a Lambda function as well. And then whatever arguments there are to that function. And so these get transferred over and enqueued on, on the target. And then at some later point, the target will actually, you know, schedule that for execution, execute it, and send back whatever results there are. Okay, but in the meantime, what we get at the initiator, again, because it's asynchronous, you get back a future that, um, that represents both the result and the readiness, the completion of the operation. And when the target process actually um, finishes executing that RPC, it will send back a notification as well as whatever um, return values there are from that RPC. Okay, and then at that point, the future will become ready and the initiator can, um, can check for its completion and obtain its results if any. And again, because these are asynchronous, so you can have many of the questions on this. All right, so then let's get digging into actual UPC++ code. Okay, so here we have a simple hello world. I've actually shown you an example um, when I talked about the SPIMD model. This is an even simpler example because we don't have um, any barriers inside of it. As I mentioned before, a UPC++ plus pro uh, plus program before it does UPC++ plus plus operations need to, needs to initialize the library. Okay, so this sets up the runtime. It sets up the underlying GasNet uh, layer as well. It is a collective operation, so all the, all the processes that are uh, participating in UPC++ code must call this. Afterwards, then um, the program can do UPC++ operations. Here we just have um, calls to rank me and rank n. Rank me is the process number of the caller. Rank n is the number of processes that are um, in the program. Now we'll mention uh, that um, our convention in the slides is to underline and color in red UPC++ names. Okay, so we will soon drop the UPC XX um, namespace qualifier for simplicity, but then you know hopefully it'll still be clear what is a UPC++ name, plus name because it will be underlined in, in a different color. At the end of the program, again, just like with MPI, um, the program must call finalize in order to tear down um, the runtime. Now here we don't have any synchronization between these messages. So those messages can appear on the console in any order and depending on the system may actually even be interleaved. Okay, in terms of compiling and running a UPC plus program, we provide a compiler wrapper called UPCXX. This is similar to M MPI CXX if you have used that. And it supports flags in terms of uh, debug versus optimization mode. You can specify which network conduit to use if there are more than one available. And then other arguments are similar to sort of um, a standard C++ compiler, dash O for the executable and so on. Now, we also provide other ways of compiling UPC++ programs, which is useful for interoperation. So for instance, there's a tool called UPC XX meta that actually will extract the, will generate the necessary flags for passing directly to your um, C++ compiler. And then we also provide uh, CMake integration as well. In terms of running a program, we provide a, an, a wrapper for that as well called UPC XX run. So again, this is similar to MPI run or MPI exec. You can specify the process count you can also specify the node count with dash n, uh, dash, sorry, with dash capital N. The specify the program executable and then whatever, oh, sorry about that. 
and then whatever arguments there are um, to the program. UPC++ can be downloaded and installed in just a few minutes. Um, you'll find um, instructions for doing that uh, linked through the tutorial materials. But for those of you, again, who actually have uh, nurse training accounts for use on Cori, then it's already set up for you. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll actually transition to getting everyone hopefully up and running um, on, you know, specifically for those of you in the room on Cori, but for those of you who are at home, um, hopefully you can take this opportunity to get UPC++ um, installed on your own machine. Um, everything you need is available from the link um, for the tutorial, and you'll see actual instructions for what to do. All right, so to start off with, again, we just want uh, to make sure that everyone is set up and running. So exercise zero is just the hello world that you've actually already, that we just saw. Um, so go ahead and go through the process of getting yourself set up. Um, once you actually have yourself set up and have a copy of the of the of the tutorial materials in the exercises direct directory, you can actually uh, compile and run using the make file. So make run dash ex zero will both compile and run the ex zero .cpp program. Um, you'll notice that. When it runs through the make file, it'll, have, it'll actually show the full path for UPC XS, XX and UPC XX run. But for those of you on Cori, those are those commands are already in the path as well. So you can, if you want to actually run manually or compile man, manually, you could you could just type UPC XX, uh, UPC XX run. Um, for those of you who are ready to move on, um, you can get started on the next exercise, um, which is you know to modify. Um, the program that we give you, which is now an ex1.cpp, so that the processes take a turn doing the output. Okay, so the general idea is um, have a loop where the processes take a turn and then use a barrier to prevent uh, processes from sort of getting out of sync. Um, so you'll notice that for this particular one, we're writing to a file just because console output on many systems, there isn't really a way to order it whereas with files there is. So again, um, go ahead and take a few minutes for those of you who are ready to, um, to work on that. Please pause the video here to work exercise one. All right, so let's um, actually take a look at a solution for this. And I'll mention that uh, for those of you who are looking at um, the slides on your own, there is a link that should work in your PDF viewer uh, to take you to the solution. And so again, uh, the general idea is that we have the processes take turns. So we use a loop over the, over the process ranks. And then when the loop reaches um, a process's rank number, it, it does its printing. Okay, so the actual code for the printing to the file is the same as in the, the original code that we gave you with using a standard um, a web stream and then also a sync call on for uh, for POSIX based systems to actually flush out the, the data to disk. And the other thing that we need is a barrier which can appear either at the beginning of the loop or the end of, loop of the loop, but it needs to be there to prevent um, processes from essentially proceeding to the next iteration uh, before everyone has reached it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about um, RPC, remote procedure calls. We've talked about sort of the general concept, uh, but now let's actually get into the details of how to do, how to use it in UPC++. Okay, so if we have a, a function that we want to execute on some other remote process, and again, this can be just a regular C++ function. It can be a lambda, lambda function. It can also be a function object, as long as that object meets um, um, essentially is transferable over to the other end. We, um, we invoke that function remotely by calling RPC. And here I've uh, left off the UPC XX um, namespace qualifier, um, just for simplicity. We have the target process number as the first argument. We have the function as the second argument. And then any arguments to that function. So in this particular case, we have a function that um, given two sides of a rectangle computes the area, 
Okay, so it just does a multiplication. Uh, but, you know, in general, it would be something more interesting. This is just for illustration. And again, this RPC is actually going to give us back um, a feature, which we need to then call wait on and to wait for it to complete and obtain the result. Okay, so the first step is that the initiator will actually transfer over a reference to the function, as well as copies of the arguments to the target. And actually in the slides here, in terms of the data that's being transferred, I've sort of stylized the reference to this function in quotes, because again, it's not actually taking the, um, the machine code and transferring it over. All the processes are executing the same program, which means that you know, if there's an area on function on one process, there's also an area function on the other processes. So inst instead what gets transferred is, um, is a handle to that function. The arguments themselves do get um, actually transferred over. And so this, this function gets enqueued on the, on the target to be executed at some later point. Um, we will talk in more detail about at what some later point means that has to do with the progress model that we've already alluded to. So when the target process executes that, again, at some later point, whatever return values there are from, from, that, uh, from that function are going to get transferred back to uh, the initiator, in this case, process error. Okay. So again, this is asynchronous, so process zero gets back a feature from the invocation of RPC, and then when the target process from process P actually executes it and sends back a notification of the result, that's when the feature will become ready, and that's when process zero can um, go ahead and read the results. So then let's look at a concrete example. We've been talking about hello world. Let's do another hello world that um, uses RPC. And this one is also um, synchronized so that the outputs do actually appear in order. So we have the same general idea of having a loop over the, uh, over the process rank numbers. And then when it is a, par a processor's turn, it actually does an RPC over to process zero in order to do the printing. Okay, and so because only process zero does the printing, we can guarantee that the outputs will actually appear in order, even in the case of printing to standard out. So in terms of the function that we're actually passing to RPC, again, the first argument is the actual target process number. The second argument is the function to be invoked over on that target. Here we have a C++ Lambda function. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the syntax, it looks similar to just a regular function, except for, um, we don't have a return type on the left. There's a way to specify the return type on the right, but uh, it's not typical to do that, so we won't actually do it. We also don't have a name. Um, instead of the name, what we have are these square brackets. This is actually something called the lambda capture list, um, which uh, denotes sort of what values we're capturing from the local environment. In this case, we aren't capturing anything, so it is empty. We will see a couple examples later where we actually do capture um, things from the local environment. Then we have our parameter list for our lambda function. In this case, our single parameter is the rank number for the process that's actually um, invoking this RPC. And we see that that actually gets passed as the argument to the function. So the argument to the function that's being invoked is passed as another argument to the call to RPC. Okay, so again, arguments to RPC are process number, function to be invoked, and then whatever the arguments to that function are. Okay, so here we are passing uh, UPCXX rank me as the argument uh, to this Lambda function that will be invoked on process zero. Um, Again, this RPC will give us back a feature. We call wait on, on it to ensure that, um, we call wait on it to ensure that it actually completes before we hit the barrier. And so that way we make sure that um, the, the printout is done before continuing on to the next process. Okay, so we've talked about features. Let's get into a little bit more detail about um, what those are and uh, what they represent.
So again, a feature, um, just in standard programming terminology, is, is something that represents an incomplete computation, a computation that will be completed at some later point. C++ 11 has features. We have our own features, which are a distinct abstraction. In particular, um, in the case of EPC++, features represent just asynchrony. Uh, they don't actually, on their own, do communication. We have things like R put, R get, RPC that do the communication, and the future is what represents um, the completion of that and the readiness uh, of that um, asynchronous operation. Okay, it is a template which can represent zero or more values. In this particular case, we have an empty future, empty angle brackets, because this function that we're invoking doesn't have a return value, right? So the RPC actually doesn't give us back a value, but there is still a point in time where the function has finished. And so this feature, this empty feature, doesn't represent a value, but it does represent completion, whether or not that, um, that function has executed. Okay, so there is a readiness bit inside of the feature. If we invoke wait on this feature, then that will wait until the future becomes ready. Okay, again, denoting that the, the operation has completed. All right, so future is variadic. Again, zero or more values. We can um, take a look at another example over here where we have a future of int. So this is represents a single int value. And conceptually what we have is our future is actually a handle to some underlying asynchronous operation that again represents readiness has this are the results actually available? Has this operation completed? As what, what uh, in addition to whatever data values are being represented by this feature. Okay, so in the case of a feature of int, we just have an int value as our data value. If we had an empty feature, then we wouldn't have a data value. If we have a feature of say int and double, then we would have um, an int and a double as two separate data values represented by that feature. Okay, so the future, again, it's not the result itself. Question? Is the, is the data value uh, allocated at the time of the creation of the future or not until return? So the question is, is the data value allocated at the time of creation of the future or some other point? There is space for it allocated, but it's not filled in until it's actually available. And, you know, there isn't a mechanism of actually looking at the value until the future is ready. And, you know, along those lines, so again, uh, the future is, is not the result itself, it's a handle to the result. So what this means is that you can actually copy features. They, um, if you make a copy, it refers to the same underlying asynchronous operation. It has the same readiness state, it has the same result value. You can read out the result as many times as you like. We also provide uh, more complex um, mechanisms as well for for um, things that are big values, reading them, actually moving them out as opposed to making copies. So the wait method itself does two things. One is that it waits until the, the future is actually ready. And the second thing is that it automatically returns us back a copy of the results. Yeah. So in this particular feature, again, we, we get a wait until this asynchronous operation is ready, and then the result, which is three, um, gets returned to us. And then we can do whatever we want with it, store it in a variable, pass it to something else, print it out, et cetera. We will also see later that we don't necessarily need to wait on a future. There are other patterns in terms of attaching callbacks to the future, so we can actually use the then method to say, when this future becomes ready, now do this other operation. So this actually allows us to build complex DAGs of, of, um, of asynchronous operations from features. And again, we'll see more details on this later. The question was, how does it then work? How will we use it? We will actually see more detailed examples later, but just very briefly, I can actually give then a function or a lambda and tell it, um, you know, again, when this future is ready, invoke this function on the results of the future. So, so we're taking two minutes.
Exactly, it is specifying a dependency. So a feature actually, again, it allows us to overlap um, a particular asynchronous operation with other things, other asynchronous operations or even local computations. So in this particular case, what we have here is uh, we have essentially each process is um, launching RPCs to every other process in order to obtain back some data. Here we made it simple, just getting back the process number. Yep. And so we're actually storing individual features for each RPC inside of a vector. And so again, here we loop over each of the process IDs and launch an RPC to that process in order to obtain uh, the piece of data that we want from that process. And we store the feature into, into this vector over here. Okay, and notice here we're not actually calling wait anywhere inside of this loop, which means these are not being overlapped. Okay, so there, these communications are being um, launched concurrently, or actually they're, sorry, they're being, they're being launched and then they actually execute um, concurrently. And then afterwards we actually iterate over each of the features and then actually do a wait on them uh, to obtain the results. Okay, so this again is just for illustration. There are better patterns for doing an all to all exchange, which is essentially what we have here. Uh, but this just illustrates that we can actually, again, because we have features, you can actually do several asynchronous operations that they can execute concurrently. So the question, is it possible to manually construct a feature? We do provide a mechanism for constructing a feature from an already ready value. And that actually does become useful in some cases. We will see an example of that later. Okay, and the second question, can the feature be read from all nodes as many times as necessary? What is the contain, what if the contained data is large? All right, so that's actually an interesting question. The future is actually a local object. It is not something that can be transferred over to another process. Okay. Um, so, you know, the way to transfer data is through an RPORT argit or RPC or some other communication operation. The feature represents the results of an asynchronous operation, which can be some remote operation, but it also can be some asynchronous local operation as well. So again, the feature itself, unlike some other systems in UPC++, the feature just represents asynchrony, represents some computation that is incomplete and mechanisms for doing communication are um, sort of orthogonal to features themselves. <clears throat> yeah. Back to a large memory question. Uh, can you have the feature use memory you've already allocated? So can you have the feature use memory that you've already allocated? Um, so I would say that the way to do that is to sort of allocate some memory and shared space and then do something like a, do an RMA operation to do the transfer. And then the feature would just represent completion as opposed to actually obtain, uh, containing the value inside of it. So I think that's that's sort of the pattern I would recommend. Yeah, I think that pattern comes up in the advanced version of the two and hash table, which is the optional exercise at the very end of the day, correct? That, so that's right. So we do have an optional exercise um, at the end of the day, EX4, um, if you would like to take a look at it, that actually uses that pattern. The other thing is that for things that are actually do need to be transferred and read out only once, we do provide a mechanism for doing a move out of the underlying asynchronous operation as opposed to doing a copy. Yeah, it's generally not, it, features weren't designed to like actually deliver megabytes of data. They're meant to signal that megabytes of data are available in space that you provided. No, you can do that. And if your shared data is small, it will work, but we're, we're leaning on the system allocation. That's a good thing. All right, let's go ahead and uh, get restarted. Uh, so our next running example is actually going to be a, a Jacobi algorithm. And for simplicity, we'll do it in, in one dimension, um, just so that we don't have to worry about um, um, packing and unpacking. Ghost cells. So those of you who are unfamiliar with this algorithm, what this is is an out of place uh, computation where it's an iterative computation where you have um, 
the new values of grid cells are computed from the old value of the grid cell and its neighboring one. Okay, and so we will keep it simple with a three-point stencil, which means that um, the new value of a particular grid cell depends on its old value as well as the values of its immediate neighbors. Um, in terms of our data representation, we will take the full domain and divide it up evenly amongst the available processes. So for instance, if we have 12 elements total in our domain and three processes, each process will get um, four elements. We will also represent in our grid um, ghost cells. So because each of our boundary points actually needs the cells to the left and the right, we'll actually um, allocate storage for that in each process's grid. However, we won't always use that space. We will assume though, again, to keep the computation consistent, that that space is over there. We'll also, you know, assume a periodic boundary condition for the purposes of, of our discussion. So the, the left-hand um, neighbor of process zero is actually going to be uh, the last process, process two in this example. And similarly, the right-hand neighbor of that last process is gonna be process zero. So again, we will always have these ghost cells in there even if we don't actually use them in, in some of our implementations. So this means that the actual computation will go from um, index one up to grid size minus one uh, for the indices in the local grid. All right, so the key um, sort of, uh, the key uh, reason we're looking at this is how do you do the actual boundary exchange? Okay, we have these elements split up amongst the different processes, but in each iteration, there needs to be a communication in order to obtain the, um, the value from you know, our left neighbor and our right neighbor. Okay, so we refer to that as the boundary exchange, and we will look at several different ways of doing this. And I will say upfront that um, we're looking at several different ways of doing this for the purposes of learning UPC++ features, not for the purpose of optimizing to code. So to start off with, um, essentially we can use RPC to do this exchange. Again, an RPC means that we're launching a function to be executed on some other process. When the function executes on that other process, it can access variables that are in scope. Okay, so in particular, it can access things like global variables. Uh, for instance, old, old grid and new grid. Okay. But more generally, you can access anything with, um, in C++ terms, static storage duration, as long as it's in scope. So this means global or name scope, uh, namespace scope variables. It means local static variables. It means um, static member variables as well. Okay. And again, we, because all the processes are running the same program, we know that those variables exist on the other end. So here we've written a get cell function, um, which given an index will, return the value of, uh, of the cell at that index in the, in the old grid. Okay, again, with this out-of-place computation, we have two grids. We have the old grid, which has the data from the previous iteration, and we have new grid, which is where we're computing the um, data for the current iteration. Okay, so if, say I'm on process zero over here, I need to obtain the value of the, the first element over on process one. And again, that's an index one because we have allocated space for um, the go cell, even though in this case, we're not using it. Okay, so essentially we launch an RPC over towards our right neighbor. The function that we're going to be executing on that remote is this get cell function. And our argument, again, is what gets passed to this function, what this uh, function gets invoked with. And so that's the index one in order to obtain uh, this element over here. I will mention that from here on out, we will generally elide the UPCXX namespace qualifier uh, just to make the slides you know, more succinct and less cluttered. And again, just a reminder, UPC++ uh, names are underlined and in, in that red color. Okay, so here I've done this sort of synchronously just to kind of illustrate what we're, what we're doing. But really, we don't want you know, we don't want these communications to happen synchronously. Instead, we can launch the communications and then do, do the actual interior um, computation while those communications are happening. 
and then do a wait at the end, and then do uh, compute or new value for boundary cells um, at the end of the iteration. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So again, we start off by launching RPCs to, uh, to both of our neighbors. For our left-hand neighbor, we need to obtain the, the grid cell that's you know, at the uh, N minus two index. Again, N minus one is the actual ghost cell that we're not using. So the actual rightmost boundary element is at N minus two. For our right neighbor, as we saw, again, we're, again, we are executing the get cell function with the index one, uh, skipping over the ghost um, cell that we're not using. So we launch these RPCs and we give back futures, which represent uh, the value of the completion, but we don't wait at, on them immediately. Instead, we do the interior computation. Okay, so in this particular example, there are the six and seven down here in the grid, the ones that actually don't depend on data from our neighbors. We can actually do that immediately. And again, this allows us to overlap um, computation with our two communications. After we're done with that interior computation, then we can actually use weight on the futures to obtain the values from our neighbors. And so here I have the update for our leftmost boundary, this, uh, this five over here, using um, the RPC that we launched over to our left neighbor. And then similarly, the update for our right boundary cell, this eight over here, using, um, using our RPC towards our right neighbor. And then finally, because this is an iterative computation, we swap our grids um, at the end of each iteration so that our new grid, which is what we computed this iter iteration, becomes the old grid for the next iteration. All right, so it's slightly obvious to at least some of you that um, we do have some missing synchronization here. Um, what we have here is we have ensured that um, essentially we get the results of our communication when we're doing our our, our updates of our two boundary cells, but we haven't done anything to ensure that we're actually getting the right values from our neighbors. So if it so happens that um, our neighbors are actually executing a different iteration, it because again, in this FIMD model, we don't have processes executing in lockstep. They only synchronize at explicit synchronization points. So we could actually have our neighbors have been competing in a different iteration, having already swapped grids and, you know, competed new values for grids that are different than the iteration that we're on. Okay, so for instance, if my neighbor is in iteration I plus two, and I need the data from iteration I, my RPC is actually going to return me the, the wrong piece of data. Okay, so this is just like with, with shared memory where we have race conditions accessing a piece of data that is being written to by at least one uh, by at least one thread and being accessed by other threads that constitutes a race condition. We have the same thing happening over here. Okay. And so what we need is we need to actually provide explicit synchronization. Okay, so this is one of those cases where again, if we were doing this with, met with message passing, we would get synchronization coupled with our data movement, but, but because we are doing this in a one-sided fa fa uh, fashion, the two things are decoupled. The data movement and the synchron synchronization are two separate things. If we want synchronization, we have to explicitly do it. Now, I will point out that in this, in this 1D case, you can see that essentially we need more or less a synchronization for each data movement. However, a more complicated case, a, a 3D um, stencil, we could actually amortize, or even like an AMR um, ghost exchange, we can actually amortize an individual synchronization over many transfers. And so, you know, it's one of the reasons why we actually decouple the two. It's not necessarily the case that we want one synchronization per data, data transfer. Um, the flip side of that, however, is that when we need synchronization, we have to ask for it. So one solution, not a great solution, but it does work, is to actually insert barriers um, so that we, we have the synchronization uh, both before and after we do the swaps. Okay, so this barrier ensures that essentially everything is synchronized in this iteration, 
and then this barrier ensures that they're synchronized in the next iteration as well. There are, again, there are better ways of doing this. And in fact, we will look at a, an example of a barrier-free um, um, go cell exchange later on, very briefly. Okay, just to summarize, again, with the one-sided, with the RMA model, we don't automatically get synchronization with our data transfers. Instead, we have to uh, do that separately. But again, the, the advantage is that our data transfers operate more efficiently without the synchronizations, and then we can also amortize um, a synchronization over multiple transfers. So this example was using RPC to do the exchange. As I mentioned before, talking about Jacoby, we're using this um, primarily to illustrate features, not to illustrate the best way to write Jacoby. A better solution in terms of writing Jacoby is to use RMA rather than RPCs to do the transfers. Um, so, you know, we've seen very simple examples of RPUT and RGIT. I just want to give you a more, um, a more complete overview of the kinds of transfers that UPC++ provides. So we provide scalar puts and gets, which means obtaining a single um, value from some other location. These aren't typically what you'd use for, for performance. Uh, typically you'd use the, uh, the vector versions as, instead. But in terms of the scalar versions, um, you call our git on a global pointer, which presumably is referring to some memory on some other process. And that transfers back that actual piece of data. But again, we get back, this is not a synchronous transfer, so we get a future back that actually um, represents this data value inside of it. And then in order to actually wait for the, uh, to the transfer to complete, as well as obtain the value, we can call wait on it. For put, it's still asynchronous, but now there isn't actually a data value that we're getting as, as a result. Uh, in terms of the initiator. So we provide the target process, we provide a, um, sorry, we, we what? let me re, um, restate that. We provide the actual scalar value that we want to transfer. We provide the scalar value that we want to transfer as well as the target memory location as a global pointer and the R point actually does that transfer. And again, we get back a future because it is asynchronous, but we're not, we're not actually getting a value out of this transfer. We're just getting the notification that this transfer has completed. Question, yeah. Does this use RDMA writes under the hood? Or? So does this use RDMA writes under the hood if it is available in the network hardware, yes. So again, this means that even for a scalar get or put, we don't necessarily need to involve the remote CPU. But the UDP conduit does not use RDMA, is that right? That's correct. So it is emulated, right? We get the same APIs, right. but it would same be, right, the, the data transfer would copy as uh, be a, a mem copy from a, a socket receive buffer into the actual final location. Yeah, and that's why we made a distinction between RMA and the pro programming model as opposed to RDMA, which is what the uh, hardware provides. But you're absolutely correct. If you're using the UDP, con UDP, UDP conduit, as well as the MPI con conduit as well, right? Yeah, I try not to mention the MPI conduit too often. UDP and MPI are both offered as portability layers, neither is well tuned. And in the case of the MPI, you're just adding another layer over the high-speed network in most cases like, go directly to it. But they are both available, but they're both purely mem copy driven in this case from their respective receive buffers will be copying the data. And similarly, again, it's going to be a round trip where you send the metadata across to the other end, which then replies with the datum that you were trying to get. So, so in the case of the RDMA write, the remote CPU is not involved. So what happens if that code running on that CPU is accessing that data late to wait? So that's a race condition, right? Yes. So it's the same thing that we have with shared memory. So the question was, if you didn't hear, if you're doing a put, and it's not involving that other remote CPU, but that remote CPU is also accessing that same piece of data. What happens? So that's a race condition. Um, so and do you have synchronization mechanisms for that? Or? Absolutely. So you know we've seen the simplest, but probably not the best solution, which is a barrier. 
So that is a synchronization mechanism, but we provide other synchronization mechanisms as well. And you know, I will mention that we, we will talk about this very briefly later, but we also um, support remote atomics as well. Um, so if this is a situation where you don't want to do heavy handed synchronization and you know you have say offload support in your network for remote atomics, then you may want to use that instead. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the, the trade-off between the scalar and vector uh, puts and gets? And like specifically if I had, for example, a, uh, an arbitrary slice of array. Um, you know, what's the trade-off between computing you know, computing the indices and getting each one better, you know, versus doing the work of trying to, to, to gather them together? Okay, so the, you know, the question is the trade-off between, um, you know, between the scalar and, and vector versions if I have an array and if I have a slice of the array that I want to transfer. Now, there are several different situations. If the slice is contiguous, you definitely want to use the vector version. If the slice is not contiguous, then we, al we also provide non-contiguous transfers as well. We'll talk about this very, very briefly at the very end. I think it's actually our very last slide. Um, but we do actually provide um, interfaces for, for non-contiguous transfers as well. And there's three different um, APIs that we provide that trade off basically regularity with with the amount of metadata required for that for that transfer. Um, so likely what you don't want to do is just have a loop that sends individual items. That's um, almost definitely gonna give you the worst performance. So I'll just add a little bit to Andrew's answer. So uh, if it comes to a choice between packing your data into contiguous buffers and sending it, then the trade-offs are much the same as MPI or other communication that you, it really depends on the relative strength of your CPU and memory system versus that of the, the network and its paths to the memory system. But as Amir said, your question was slightly a trick question or a loaded question because for the specific case of regular slices of single or multi-dimensional arrays, we have APIs that allow you to express that very concisely and push the work off to us. And we will chunk it hopefully efficiently for the, for the network. So I didn't get a chance to actually talk about the, the vector version. So I'll just briefly mention that the way the API works is you provide a, you provide two pointers. The, the remote one needs to be a global pointer. The, the local one can be either a global pointer or it can be just a raw C++ pointer as well. Um, so in this case, for, for our get, our source is a remote. So that needs to be a, a global pointer. We're providing a local pointer as the destination and then a count, number of items. And similarly for our put, now our source in this case is a local buffer. Our remote is a global pointer for our remote buffer and we provide the count. Both of these, again, the, the data transfers are actually just memory to memory. What we get in the future is just um, an indication of when the completion, when the transfer is completed and not the actual data values themselves. Okay, so, you know, we had a question before in terms of if you had big objects, how would you do it? So this is sort of um, the pattern we would recommend for that, where the future doesn't actually represent the, all the data that's being transferred, it just represents the, the completion notification. Other questions? What types are supported in this? I, I noticed you have accessibility to user defined types and everything. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the term we use for that is serialization. And in this case, serialization is an overloaded term. We're not talking about parallel versus serial. We're talking about the concept of um, taking an in mem memory data structure and, and turning it into bytes. So we do provide a serialization interface. Um, a good chunk of it is work in progress. Um, so I think, can we actually send out a working draft if people are interested? Um, yes, yeah, so actually I would suggest that folks that are specifically interested in serialization of user types, either contact uh, me, you should all have my email from the, the pre-meeting pre stuff, or the full group, uh, which is Pagoda, they'll be on it, uh, and we'll loop you in on the draft specification that we've circulated to a, a limited group. Um, 
but yeah, that's expected to appear in our March release. So we're only a few months away from having that generally available. But you should probably describe the, the scope of what's available now. Yeah, so what, what's available right now is for types that essentially are C compatible. Um, so trivial types in C++ terminology, uh, we do support that automatically. Um, or we, I mean, sorry, we support that right now. Um, what we're intending to add support for is user-defined serialization, where you can actually define, you know, how the data gets serialized as opposed to just uh, byte copies. Uh, the other thing is that we do have support for a lot of standard library containers as well. So if you want to transfer, say, a string, for instance, um, we have support for that. In fact, one of um, one of our exercises will actually make use of that. Um, one clarification that I want to make, though, is that the R put and R get are intended for high performance cases. So we are not intending, at least in the, in the at least not in the near term, to support anything that's not a non-trivial type. So meaning that at least in the near future, R put and R get will always just do byte copies. RPC, however, is where we support um, you know, more general serialization. All right, so let's take a look at um, actually writing a boundary exchange using, making use of actual Go cells with uh, one-sided, um, we'll do one-sided puts actually in the, in the example that we'll, we'll talk about. So assuming that we have global pointers to our neighboring grids, and this is actually a pretty significant assumption, we will see that we will need to do work so that we, we get this, and we'll see several different ways of doing this. Okay, but assuming that we already have the global pointers, then we can just, you know, launch RMA operations. In this case, I'm actually showing you R git, but later on we'll see another version that uses R put as well. Okay, so if I have global pointers to my left neighbor's old grid and my right neighbor's old grid, then I can just do an R git to actually obtain the the specific element. In this case, since it's 1D, we have a single element, so we're actually using the scalar version of our git, which actually, you know, gives us a feature of double. And then for simplicity, we're waiting on it immediately to get the actual double value out of it. And similarly, for, for the right neighbor, um, we did the same thing as well. Now, one thing that I'll point out, this wasn't um, explicitly mentioned beforehand, but with Standard C++ pointers, you can do pointer arithmetic. Same thing with global pointers. And in fact, we're doing that um, over here. Left grid pointer, for instance, is a pointer to the beginning of our left neighbor's grid. The actual cell that we want is uh, this, this four over here, which is at you know, left grid G pointer plus grid size minus two. All right, so there are things that we need to do in order to make this work. The first thing is that these these grids, they actually need to be allocated in, in the shared segment of the process, not in the private segment. Again, so they need to be in the global address space to be able to be accessible uh, by other processes. Okay, so that's step number one, is we need to make sure that the grids actually do get allocated in the right place. So if we just use the built-in new operator that allocates in private memory, not in shared memory, and instead, we provide our own allocation functions for allocating in, in shared memory. Uh, the specific one that you know, I would use for allocating an array is the new array function, which is parameterized by the element type. And then it takes in the number of elements as the argument. And again, so this does the allocation in the shared segment and gives us back a global pointer that is referring to the newly allocated memory. Now these allocations are not collective. They are neither collective nor synchronizing. Okay, so not collective means that each processor can allocate its own memory as needed. We don't require every single process to call a new array um, you know, at the same time. So what, what this means is that um, other processes don't automatically actually get a copy of that global pointer. Okay, if I call a new array, I get the global pointer. If I want somebody else to have it, I need to give it to them essentially, or provide some other means for them to obtain it. The second thing is, again, we don't have a synchronization either. So if that other process is going to be actually obtaining the grid pointer asynchronously, 
say through an RPC, as we'll see momentarily, then we will also need a synchronization to ensure that the allocation has happened um, before that RPC gets processed. Okay. And so the core reason for this is that we do not actually require a symmetric heap. A sym there's two main reasons why we don't use a symmetric heap. The first is that it generally requires non-scalable data structures uh, to implement internally. And the other thing is that it doesn't actually compose with um, process teams, like subset teams. So UPC++, unlike UPC, does not actually assume a symmetric heap. And instead, each of the processes allocate independently, and then you need to do communication in order um, to obtain global pointers from a different process. All right, before we actually consider communication, um, again, this new array will actually return back a global pointer. It is to memory owned by the calling process, but it is a global pointer as well. Okay, now typically speaking, you don't want to actually do computation using global pointers. Number one is because syntactically, again, you can't just dereference it. You have to use something like argit. So the syntax isn't particularly nice. Uh, the second reason is that we want, you want to avoid a, a conditional down in the runtime. So if I have a global pointer, there's no way for the system to know that it's local unless it has to check. And so that means if I do the argit on it, there is in, in the runtime, there is a conditional. Is it actually local or remote? And we don't want to be paying that on every access. Okay, so typically what you want to do is you want to actually take this global pointer and convert it down to a raw C++ pointer, where now you can use the dereference operator. You don't have to pay that overhead for the conditional and the runtime. Okay, so this can be done with the local method call on a global pointer. So again, we obtain, we allocate the arrays in, in shared memory by using the new array function. That gives us back a global pointer, and then we can call dot local on these global pointers to actually obtain raw C++ pointer. Okay, so what we're looking at over here right now is, you know, each individual process allocates its own grid and then uses dot local to downcast it to a raw C++ pointer. Later on, we will see that even if you have pro processes that share memory, let's say live on the same node, you can also downcast each other's global pointers as well in order to obtain a raw C++ pointer that provides direct load store access. But again, we'll come back to that later. For now, we need to do the second piece, which is essentially here we've talked about everything is local. Uh, sorry, everything is within a single process. We need to actually now do the work of communicating our global pointers between our processes. And so we actually refer to this as sort of the bootstrapping problem. We have, um, you know, eventually we have some data exchange. We need to bootstrap it by making sure that everyone knows essentially each other's global pointers or whatever global pointers they need in order to uh, do that communication. Okay, and again, this is because allocation is not collective. Each process does its own allocation and therefore we need, the processes need to actually communicate the resulting global pointers. So one way we can do this is just by using RPC. Okay, so if I have my allocations, I can do an RPC to my neighbors in order to obtain their grid pointers. In the case of Jacoby, we'd want to do this just once rather than on every iteration. So essentially what we want to do is obtain pointers to both grids and then, you know, essentially do the swaps of our neighbor pointers in each iteration rather than having to recommunicate um, what the old grid pointer is in each iteration. Okay, so we have, we, what we want is at the beginning, a single transfer to obtain both the, both of our global pointers from our individual neighbors, okay, both the old grid and, and our new grid. We could do this with two separate RPCs, but better to do this with just a single transfer, right? So there's several different ways we could do a single transfer. Option number one is wrap it up inside of a, a std pair or std tuple. Um, you can do that, it works. Syntax is a little bit uh, hairier because we have a feature wrapped around a pair wrapped around global pointers. 
Instead, we can actually do that just directly with futures because futures are also variadic, just like tuples are. Right? So we talked about a future representing zero or more values. This would be the case where we want a feature to actually represent two values or two global pointers. Okay, so the way to do that is within our RPC function, we actually construct a feature out of our two grid pointers here. Again, so this is running on our target process, our left process. It constructs a ready future, and then RBC returns that future. Now, when you have the case where RBC returns a future, essentially the library takes care of, you know, flattening it out and avoiding that kind of thing. Okay, so we have RBC return a future. What we get out is not a future of future. We need, it gets flattened out into just a single level future of the two global pointers over there. Questions on this? Yeah. I mean, how, how do I know that on the other process, I mean, remote process, that the grid two pointer is already uh, initialized? So you don't, and that's one of the things that um, the the full bootstrapping actually needs to needs that synchronization. Okay, and we'll see, um, we'll see the full code momentarily, and you'll see that there's actually a barrier in there to uh, ensure that all the grids are going to help. Yeah, so not a not a question, but an observation. This is the response to the question of about an hour ago when someone asked if there was a way to uh, manually construct a future. So this make future is in fact the, the mechanism for, for that. And there's also a well, there's a lot more in the specification that we're just touching the, the tip of an iceberg involving uh, futures and promises. And I will also, just as a follow up to your question, um, there are other mechanisms for doing this bootstrapping. We will see them after lunch. So I just want to put in a, a forward pointer that, um, you know, RPC is usually not the best mechanism for doing this. We have um, a specific construct called the distributed object that, um, that is intended for this problem. And that actually avoids that, um, barrier to make sure that everyone has allocated. So we will see that again, we'll see that after lunch. Um, but for now, you know, we'll look at the the RPC based version. So one other thing that I want to mention is that um, essentially we we invoke an RPC to obtain our two grid pointers. And sort of what, what we've seen so far, essentially the way we would unpack them is we would have a weight and then we would pull them out of the that isn't the only way of operating with, with features. So we briefly talked about attaching callbacks. Let's actually go ahead and do that in this case here. Okay, so again, rather than manually unpacking this after waiting for the feature to end, to end instead, what we'll do is we will attach a callback to this feature to have you know, the library essentially automatically when the feature is ready, do the unpacking. Okay, so here we have our RPC as before. We get a, a future with our two global pointers as a result. And so then what we can do is we can attach this callback to it, which takes as arguments, here we have a Lambda function. It takes as arguments, whatever data is contained inside of our future. Okay, so in this case, our two global pointers as separate arguments. And then we, here we have the code to actually, um, you know, set our left old grid and left new grid from the data that was actually transferred. Okay. So again, you could do it with weight. You could do uh, few dot weight and then pull the, and then do dot first in order to get um, the left old grid. And so you'd have to do a little bit more work to do it with, with weight or weight tuple. And so it's much more simple, simple to do this with, with a callback instead. Okay, so again, what we're doing is we're attaching this callback um, to this feature. It will get executed when the feature is ready. And then this callback itself is represents an asynchronous operation. So re the result of this dot then is a feature itself. Okay, and here we are directly returning the, the result of dot then. And so we see that the what that produces is an empty feature in this case. And it's empty because this callback doesn't have a return value. If the callback actually returns something, then it would be a non-empty feature. Okay, so I don't actually have the full details of the bootstrapping in the slides, um, but I'll just briefly overview it uh, verbally. And if you want to take a look, um, I think if you take a look at exercise two, you'll see that um, 
um, you'll see more details about the bootstrapping. You'll see that there's also like the bootstrap write is empty because that's what you need to do in the exercise using um, a different mechanism. But essentially what you need to do is we have our allocation that we did before. You do need to put in a barrier to make sure that everything is allocated before you can you actually go ahead and you know obtain the pointers from our neighbors. Okay, so essentially it looks like you know allocation, barrier, now bootstrap, bootstrap left and bootstrap right in order to obtain those pointers. Questions on this? Oh, um, you might want to read out your footnote at the bottom because it's cut off by Zoom right now. Oh, <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. The footnote says that we will talk about distributed objects. I already mentioned this, that we will do that after lunch, which essentially abstract away this, uh, this bootstrapping for us. Okay, so this isn't intended to be, this is how you should pass around the global pointers. Again, you know, we're sort of doing this to just demonstrate that this is an option and also to introduce the concept of callbacks to simplify uh, working with the results of an asynchronous operation. Other questions or comments? So at, at this point, we're responsible for managing our own metadata like the array indices and sizes and their, their location in the global yeah, yeah. And so we'll see that distributed objects do help um, in terms of doing the bootstrapping and the management. But, um, you know, the idea is that, yeah, the, the application, it knows its metadata best, so it should keep track of it. Okay, so just as another example of callbacks, let's actually come back to our Jacobi um, boundary exchange and computation that used RPC. And again, the way that we did it before was we launched the RPCs. We did the interior computation, we did a weight on the RPCs, and then did the boundary computations. Okay, instead with callbacks, we could actually express the boundary computations at the same point where, where we actually express the data transfer. Okay, so again, this that advantage is that we're expressing both the communication as well as the, the update based on the communication in the same place, rather than having to split it up. So essentially, here I've just shown you the, the the computation and communication for the left-hand neighbor, it would be similar for the right-hand neighbor, but essentially what I'm doing is, as before, launching an RPC to obtain the, um, the required grid value from my left-hand neighbor, but now I'm attaching a callback that actually does the, the computation for the left-hand boundary cell. And again, rather than putting that computation down here, we're putting it directly where we're, where we're doing the communication. Because this callback doesn't have a return value, we get an empty future out of it, which again now just represents whether, that, um, whether the RPC and the resulting callback has completed. And eventually, you know, we can wait on that to ensure that it does actually complete. All right, a few more details in terms of working with callbacks. We get a future out of our callback, which means that we can attach another callback to that as well. So we can actually build long chains of callbacks just by you know, attach, using VIN to attach more computations to, um, to, our existing, um, to our existing chain. Okay, so just as an example over here, if I do an rget, that gives me back a future. Here I'm doing a scalar rget, so I'm actually just getting back a single int value um, represented inside of a future. Then I can attach some other computation to that. And again, this, this function that I'm invoking is going to actually take in the value from that future when it is ready. And so in this case, I'm actually computing the, the log of that and returning that. And so what I get back is actually a double because uh, the log returns a double. And again, it's a future of double because it's an asynchronous computation. And then I can attach something else to that. In this case, what I'm doing, what I want to do with that result is I want to put it somewhere else. So here I am constructing a callback that internally is actually going to invoke our put. Now this our put itself returns a future and the then returns a future, but again, as I mentioned beforehand, when we have this, when we have something like an RPC or a callback return a future, 
And the RPC itself also gives us a feature. Those actually get collapsed into just a single bubble. Okay, so this is an empty feature. This returns a feature of that, but these get collapsed into just a single empty feature. So that's what we get as a result. So far, we've just expressed the computation. We haven't ensured that it actually happens. The way we do that is by a call to wait. And we only need to wait on that last feature. Okay, because essentially what we've done is we've built this dependency graph and this is only going to be ready when this is ready, which is only going to be ready when this is ready. Okay, so this allows us to build an entire um, chain of, of callbacks and then just wait on the last one to ensure that the entire chain is completed. Okay, so here we've just built a linear chain. You can imagine, well, what if I have some operation that actually depends on, say, multiple, um, has multiple dependencies? Well, we can express that as well. So we provide a, a when all function template that takes in an arbitrary number of features and conjoins them. Essentially, we have a, um, you know, the when all gives us back a feature that is ready when all of the input features are ready. Okay, so it's a big and essentially in terms of their readiness. And so this allows us to actually have computations where we have multiple dependencies. Okay, so for instance, if I have some, some computation that requires uh, data from two different sources, so here I do R git on source one to obtain an int. R git on source two is going to obtain a double. Of course, I get back features because this is asynchronous. I can use win all to construct a feature that represents the results from both operations as well as the readiness of both operations. So again, this feature int double is only going to be ready when both of the feature one and feature two are ready. And then now I can attach some computation to that that takes in both of these as arguments. In this case, we're just doing a multiplica multiplication and putting it somewhere else. And so what I have is now not just a linear um, set of dependencies, but I, again, I have a DAG. And once again, I get back a single feature that represents this entire DAG, this entire directed acyclic graph of computation. And I just need to do a single wait to um, ensure that all of it happens. Question? Yeah. Um, so how, how does this work with uh, auto? So it's like they're writing the second feature with int comma double types write auto. You or can replace all of these uh, types in these declarations with auto, correct? Yeah. The callback signature always has to match the template argument signature, right? So this, case. the rule is that um, this function needs to be invocable on the, the data that the feature actually represents. So in this case, because this feature represents an int and a double, we're invoking on, on int and double. Um, I believe it, it would also work if this was a double double, right? Yeah, double double would work. And then you can throw in references of certain types in there too. As long as the secret list compiler can implicitly convert from what's in the feature to what the Callback expects it will work fine. But auto really wouldn't. Auto would work in C plus plus fourteen or seventeen. When did yeah. you add auto? Or fourteen. Right. Your text. The arguments to a function can do auto. Uh, in which case, it would work there. Yeah. So it would work work if you're using auto for the arguments. Uh, I think. We agreed that C14 was where that, where that was introduced, but it may have been 17. Um, so as long as the underlying C compiler allows it, it would, it would be fine. I will also point out that I think this is our first example of using a capture in our Lambda here. Okay, so what we're doing is we're capturing the, the target variable by value. And so therefore we can actually refer to it from within the body of this Lambda. Okay, but our by value capture means that we actually get a copy of that global pointer stored inside of this lambda function. Um, and that's what's going to be used as the target of that output. Other questions? Yeah. So let's see, if, if future two, for example, instead of returning a scalar, it was made with make future, so it had a tuple of return value, what would the future of the when all 
look like? What would that so mean? what specifically do you have in mind? Say this so was... if future two actually was, you know, return double double uh, yeah. uh, tuple. So if, if, if future two was double double, then the, the result of the both would be int double double. So it essentially combines all the all the all the data from the the features that are passed as arguments in left to right order. So so then that, that future both would be int comma double comma double. So exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then your you know your callback would need to be invocable on those three separate um, arguments. All right. So let's look at um, an example of of using um, conjoining as well as now doing RMA for our boundary exchange. Okay, we saw very briefly using rgit um, as RMA for boundary exchange, but here we're using rput instead. So we're using a push model rather than a pull model. But essentially what I can do is at the beginning of my iteration, actually launch off puts of, of my boundary cells to my two neighbors. Um, um, and again, here these are these are vector puts, even though it's only transferring a single piece of data, because we are providing um, both the, the source as well as the target memory locations. The target memory locations are global pointers, so they're pointers to the correct index into our neighboring grids. And because this is, um, because these are puts, we get back empty features, which again just represent the completion of the operation and don't contain some data values instead. When I combine two empty features with win all, I still get an empty feature as a result. Okay, so this is why this puts feature is still an empty feature. So then we can do our interior computation. We can do a wait again on just a single result of win all rather than having to wait our, on our individual R puts. And so this ensures that my outgoing uh, messages have been received. Okay. I don't know yet whether or not my incoming messages, so I have my neighbors putting towards me, and so I don't have a way of ensuring that that is ready until I do the barrier. Okay, so when they, when my neighbor hits, hits the barrier, my neighbor's put has completed, so that means that that data has arrived at me as well. And so after this barrier, I can go ahead and uh, do my boundary computations. Okay. So this is a case where actually we couldn't just attach these as callbacks to um, to this feature in a callback to this feature because we need that barrier um, beforehand. And if anyone before I'm going to preempt the question, no, you can't do a barrier inside of a callback. Um, so you can, essentially, you can't block inside of a callback because that's our automatic deadlock essentially. I believe we have a diagnosed constant though, right? Uh, it depends. Some situations can be diagnosed. Oh, and that barrier is global, right? This is a global barrier. Um, now, in this case, it doesn't need to be global. You can, we only need point to point synchronization with our neighbors. And so there's different ways of doing this. You can actually just construct it. Uh, left and right teams that just have me and one of my neighbors and do a barrier on that. Um, or you could do the point-to-point -point synchronization using other mechanisms as well. And, you know, while we're being asked, and also we're, you know, I think going to transition to lunch momentarily, um, since the question was asked, there's all sorts of other things that you can do as well. So for instance, um, you know, one of our advanced topics is essentially you could actually chain uh, an RPC to this output as, as sort of a, a completion handler on the remote end. And so you could actually put the computation in there. So essentially do what we refer to as a signaling put, which is you know, do this put and then do this computation on the remote side as after that put has completed. And so you could actually put that boundary comp um, computation, you know, directly as sort of the completion handler on the remote side for the pit, uh, which would avoid the need for a barrier. Effectively making the hack coming back your signals exactly. and everything synchronous. Exactly. Yeah. Right, so there is, um, if, 
for the uh, in case you missed it in the in the actual tutorial materials there's there's the exercises directory which, which has the exercises but there's also an examples directory which has sort of you know more detailed examples including several different variants for things like the jacobi 1d computation so as paul was mentioning um, in the examples directly directory the the jack 1d that's over there has several different variants in terms of this boundary exchange uh, some of which we've discussed other questions so from the chat we have um, for non periodic boundary condition i assume is straightforward except the node must be aware of its relative position in the grid in order to change the start and node exchange flavor question mark or are there other considerations question mark so I think it's relatively straightforward for a non-boundary con, con, uh, non-boundary condition. So if it was just a fixed boundary condition, um, you know, you would. I guess I would do it, but with a conditional. Yeah. Um, essentially, if I'm process zero, I wouldn't do my left uh, transfer, and if I'm process rank n minus one, then I wouldn't do the right one. But that's sort of um, essentially an algorithmic consideration in terms of the best way to do that. Certainly for this tutorial, it was simplest to pick periodic because it meant not cluttering slides with if I'm the leftmost or if I'm the rightmost. But I don't think there are other significant considerations, as you said. Just yeah, I mean, and, and there's different algorithmic way, ways of doing this. I can just do a um, a useless output, for instance, to avoid the conditional and make sure that it's local so that it doesn't actually have much overhead. Um, so there's different ways of dealing with it algorithmically, but there's no like, I, I wouldn't say that there, there's any additional considerations that the UPC++ library um, adds as constraints. Makes sense, thanks, was the response just now. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so using the otherwise dead time to fill in a few things. Um, there was also some questions uh, that went on in the, in the chat regarding uh, things like um, process layout, NUMA, affinity, and stuff like that, to which the answers are generally that the UPCXX run is a convenience wrapper, but that if you have a system like a Cray integrated system that has AP run or S run on a cluster or a Cray system managed by Slurn. We do support launching directly with those. So all of those facilities for process layout, uh, pinning to NUMA domains, pinning to cores, those are all available from those native tools. We haven't tried to replace them or augment them or do as well or better than they do. Um, so when you need those facilities that are not options to UPCXX run, they're all there. You just now need to think about which system you're on since we haven't provided some magical mapping uh, across them. So I, I mentioned previously that we do have a, an abstraction of a distributed object um, to help with the bootstrapping problem. And so let's actually discuss that in more detail. But essentially what we have is we have an object that is partitioned over a set of processes. By default, this is all the processes in the system, but these also actually support subset teams as well. And uh, essentially, you can think of it as a, um, a 1D array where each process has a single element. Okay, so uh, in this particular case, we invoke the constructor by providing <coughs> our own local value, and then there's one value per, uh, per process uh, over which this distributed object is allocated. So this is conceptually similar to a co array if you're familiar with that from Cohen Fortran, but there are some significant uh, advantages to distributed object over co arrays. So, you know, perhaps the big list, biggest one is that uh, we use a scalable data representation internally. So we don't actually require uh, full replication underneath the hood. We don't require a symmetric heap. Constructing a distributed object is collective but it does not actually require communication and it does not involve a synchronization. Okay, so collective means that all the processes within um, this team need to actually um, construct the dist object and construct multiple dist. If they are constructing multiple dist objects, they need to be in the same order. 
Um, and that way, the library can ensure that the underlying universal name of the distributed objects is consistent across the processes. Uh, but again, the actual construction does not do any communication and it does not involve any synchronization whatsoever. And of course, as I mentioned, we can we support construction over subset teams um, as opposed to um, co arrays, which generally don't. So if we look at this allocation down here on the right, we see that we are constructing a dis distributed object with type int. So that means that each process that is um, constructing this distributed object has an int value. And then for this particular case, we're using um, a random number generator to generate that value. And we can see that each of the processes have a local representative of that distributed object with their, with their int value. Unfortunately, Zoom is again cutting off the bottom of the slide. So just to be clear, those are uh, labels process zero, process uh, one, dot, 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 process two, minus one. Okay, so let's actually talk about something diff uh, different than Wendy Jacoby momentarily, uh, just to illustrate different use cases of distributed object and different features that it provides. Okay, so instead we'll look at a Monte Carlo computation of pi. And this involves essentially throwing darts at a dartboard and see whether or not they land on it. Okay, so each process will have a set of trials where they compute random points in the unit square and see whether or not those points um, land within the unit circle. We know, we know that the ratio in terms of just this quadrant of the unit circle to the unit square is pi over four. So we can count how many of those random points land inside of the, uh, land inside of the circle to get an estimation of pi over four. And this is embarrassingly parallel, so we can actually do this, um, we can do this computation in parallel and essentially just add up the, the trials for each of the individual processes. Now, conceptually speaking, what we need is a reduction. We do actually provide a reduction. So the, the examples that I'm going to show you aren't the best way to do this, but they are illustrative of this object and the features that it provides. Okay, if you actually wanted to do this, then you should just do a reduce. So our first implementation will just use a distributed object to actually represent the, count, the counter on each individual process. So here we have, we're assuming we have a hit function that actually does the full work of uh, coming up with a random point and determining whether it lies within the unit circle. So it's gonna return zero if it lies outside the unit circle, one if it does, and so therefore we can just count up how many of our trials actually land in the unit circle just by adding up uh, the return values from hit. By the way, we do have this implementation in the examples directory in the tutorial materials. So you can take a look at the actual C++ code for doing this if you want. Um, it's not terribly interesting for our purposes, but it is interesting if you wanna know how to, to say, generate random numbers using fancy C++ 11. In terms of, again, representing the counters, we can actually store the individual counters as part of a distributed object. Initially, each process's value is zero, and then each time um, they get a hit, they just increment their own version, of their own value for this distributed object. Now, syntactically, we do actually support the dereference operator over here to actually obtain your own value. Now I mentioned before that we don't support the dereference operator on global pointer because it's not syntactically clear that that results in a communication. And so instead we provide methods such as our put and uh, sorry, functions such as our put and our get that do the transfers instead. In this case, however, we do actually provide the dereference operator because this doesn't involve communication. This just gives us our own local copy. Okay, so therefore this, this dereference is not actually hiding any communication, it's just obtaining the local value that we already have. Okay, at this point we have done no communication whatsoever, nor any synchronization. What we can do in, our, in terms of doing this sort of hand-rolled reduction is have rank zero actually pull in the results from every single process. In this particular case, we have a barrier just to ensure that everyone is done with all their trials so that it is valid for uh, process zero to actually read the final results. 
As far as obtaining the results, there's a fetch method on the distributed object. It takes the process number and it obtains a copy of that process's value of this distributed object. Okay, so here we have a loop where we're iterating over each of the processes and obtaining their value for this distributed object and then adding it up to a, a sum total. As with all communication operations, they are asynchronous. We get a future back as a result. So in this case, I'm just doing the simple thing, which is invoking wait immediately. Of course, we'd likely want to do something different where we can actually um, overlap these communications, and we will see an example of that momentarily. Questions on this? Yeah. So this is allocated in private memory, so so it's not part of your main fetch. So I believe it is allocated in private memory in terms of the underlying um, uh, object underneath the distributed object. Yes, yeah, that int is in private memory. So this actually uses RPC underneath the hood in order to obtain the value. And what, one of the things that we will see later is that RPC actually has some um, built-in logic for distributed objects. So if I actually say pass a distributed object as an argument to the RPC, it actually gets translated over to the local representative of that on the remote side. Uh, but we'll come back to that uh, later. All right, so in this particular example, we see that we have an explicit synchronization after everyone is done with their trials to ensure that um, it is valid for process zero to actually read the, uh, their local representative. However, we can actually elide this synchronization because when we do a fetch on a distributed object, if that distributed object has not been constructed on the remote end, that fetch actually waits for it to be constructed before um, returning. Okay, so instead what we could do is rather than storing our counter directly in our distributed object, we can just have a local counter and then construct a distributed object when we're done with our local count. So, that's what this example is doing over here. We do our, our actual trials in just a regular old C++ local variable. And then we construct the dist object after we're done. And then now when process zero actually fetches the, the representative from a different process, if that process isn't done yet, if it hasn't reached that construction of the dist object, the, the fetch is actually deferred until it does so. Okay, so we're guaranteed that this result that we're going to get out of this fetch is actually going to be after the target process has constructed it and provided its uh, total count. All right, so there was a question beforehand in terms of, you know, when we were looking at the bootstrapping problem for Jacoby, we constructed the arrays and there was this question about, you know, with RPC, do you have to actually do a synchronization to ensure that those arrays have been created? In the case of RPC, yes, you do. However, if you use a distributed object instead, then you don't, okay? Because the distributed object mechanism itself, when we do a fetch, ensures that that distributed object is created before the fetch returns. So instead you can just algorithmically um, defer the construction of the, the distributed object until the underlying data is ready. Just to isolate that, the synchronization we're talking about is not a barrier. This is you know, per call, ordering the return does not occur until oh, sorry, the run of the RPC that does the fetch does not occur until the object has been instantiated. We're not talking about a global barrier. We're talking about you know, careful implicit synchronization on each of the fetches. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification, Paul. Yeah, and, and, and I'll add to that in that, you know, we talked about this isn't, fetch isn't actually doing an RDMA, it's doing an RPC, which means that it's actually using the remote CPU to do that which means that we can actually arrange for the remote CPU to wait to process that RPC until the distributed object is actually created. All right, so then let's actually have you all do an example of this um, in exercise two. So this is, again, the Jacobi code. We have done the bootstrapping of the left using RPC. What we would like you to do is bootstrap um, to obtain the global pointers from the right neighbor using a distributed object instead. Okay, so um, again, your task is to fill in the definition for bootstrap right. 
And the end result is that write old grid and write new grid should contain pointers to the grids that are on my right hand neighbor. Please pause the video here to work exercise two. All right, we'll continue <laughs> onward at this point. I will show you a couple of different solutions. So solution number one is just use two separate uh, distributed objects for each of for each of the pointers. So here, what we've done is we've created um, individual distributed objects for each global pointer. Uh, D opt old for the old grid pointer and D opt new for the new grid pointer. And then we do individual fetches on each of those two distributed objects to actually obtain uh, obtain those results. And of course, you can you can actually overlap these by obtaining the by launching both of the fetches and uh, storing them in features and then doing weights on the features instead. Here we've kept it you know super simple on, on the slide in terms of doing both of them synchronously. Now there is a barrier at the end. This was actually provided to you in the starter code. The reason for that barrier is for a different reason than what we talked about in terms of the entry barrier. Um, you know, the entry barrier is for ensuring that the objects are ready before they are accessed by, by remote processes. But as we mentioned with distributed object, we don't need those entry barriers. The exit barrier, however, ensures that the distributed object doesn't get destroyed before everybody is done accessing it. Okay, so it's essentially um, a barrier to prevent destruction of the distributed object before everyone is done obtaining the data. Questions on this solution? So is, is it implied that this is pulling over the entire global pointer or is it still just a remote reference? I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the data itself. So it's not pulling over the, the question was, is this pulling over the entire remote data or just essentially a reference to it? What we're getting is a global pointer, which is just the, the address and affinity, right? So we're not actually pulling over the, the, the values of the grid, just a pointer to the grid from the other side. So this still hasn't really solved our problem, right? We still need to index into it and get the data with our as well. So we do still need to do the communication to actually obtain the data, but in the Jacobi algorithm, that's something that needs to be done on every iteration, right? What needs to be done just at the beginning is to obtain the actual pointer so that we can actually do the either R puts or R gets to obtain the actual data values themselves. Other questions? All right, so a better solution is to actually just use a single distributed object in order to represent both pointers so that we only need to do a single communication uh, with each neighbor. So what we've done over here is we've created a dist object that actually now stores a, a pair of pointers. We're using std pair for that, and I've actually introduced a typed alias here just to make the syntax nicer. <coughs> and in fact, this is something for those of you who are new to C++, I would highly recommend you do, is introduce aliases as needed so that you're not writing massive nested templates everywhere. Okay, so our pointer pair is a pair of two global pointer doubles. You could use a std tuple, you could use std array. There's many different ways you could do this. So this is just one option. We initialize it with a pair of our old pointer and our new pointer. And here we're using fancy um, initializer list to actually represent the initial value of that pair. And then we do the fetch. We're only doing one, so there isn't uh, anything to overlap. But if we were doing both bootstrap left and bootstrap right, then we would have a fetch from each neighbor, and then we might want to overlap those. And again, here we're using fancy C++ to actually do the unpacking. This weight will return us a, a pair with our, with our two pointers, and standard high allows us to essentially constructs a pair from these two variables as references, and then the, the assignment copies the individual values from, uh, from the resulting pair into those, uh, in, into those two variables that are in the tie. You don't need to, to use tie, you can actually pull them out manually yourself. 
with a pair, you can do dot first or dot second to get each of the two items. If you're using um, std tuple, then you can use standard get zero, standard get one in order to obtain the, the individual items as well. Questions on this? All right, so hopefully it's, it's, it's clear that when it comes to actually doing that bootstrapping, which is again, making sure that everyone has global pointers to the data, data they need, distributed object is, is a good way to do that. So going back to the pie example, essentially we talked about using distributed object to build our own reduction. But the way that we had done it was was synchronously, where we had a loop in each in each iteration of the loop. We did a fetch of one process's value, and then we did await immediately. And instead, essentially, what we'd like to do is you know build up an entire dependency graph from all the fetches together, and so end up with a single future at the end that results that represents those fetches from every single process. Okay, so. The way we do that is essentially we build up our future um, iteratively, starting from a base case of just an empty future. And so here we have make future to construct an empty ready future. And then we loop over our processes and essentially, um, essentially construct a more complex uh, future that, that actually now represents not just the existing results, but also the, the new fetch for that individual target process. Okay, so essentially what, what, what I'm doing over here is I'm doing the fetch and I'm also attaching a callback to actually do the update as well. So this does the increment in, in terms of a callback to that, uh, to that fetch. The callback has no return values, so we get an empty future as, as a result of this callback. And then we combine this with all future, which is our existing set of futures so far in order to come up with a new empty future that represents not just this call back and fetch, but also the ones that have executed previously. And just to point out here, we have another capture list in our Lambda over here, but this time we are actually capturing by reference rather than capturing by, by value. And so that way we can actually do the increment correctly. Questions on building up this? Yeah. Can you do by reference across RPCs? So here we're not actually doing an RPC. This this understand. this callback is actually just local. If we were, if you're capturing by reference to send in an RPC, it you're likely not going to get what you intended. Okay. And of course, for those of you who are um, more familiar with C++. <laughs> You should know that capturing by reference raises lifetime concerns. So you essentially need to make sure that these callbacks all get executed before total goes out of scope, which we do by sticking in await at the end. Okay, but again, the nice thing here is what we're doing is we're building up a dependency graph and we just do a wait on our final future rather than having to wait on things individually. So just to demonstrate what that dependency graph looks like, we start off again, our base case is an, is an empty future that's already ready. And then in each iteration, we attach another feature that represents the combination of a fetch as well as the update for that result of that fetch. And so this um, update gives us another empty future and we combine them with win all into, um, into another empty future that represents both. Okay, so essentially we're attaching in each iteration, another empty future to the existing feature that we already have. And the final result is that we have a single feature that represents this entire um, DAG of computation that we can just call wait individually on. Questions on this? Just want to observe one more time. We have a reduction. This is a horrible way to do a reduction. Um, this is intended simply to demonstrate the tools we have, not the best way to solve the problem. Thank you for the clarification, Paul. Uh, but you can imagine other cases that are like 
that aren't a reduction where you want to essentially uh, construct a DAG of computation and just have a single feature represent the entire thing. So that's really the core thing that we're trying to illustrate here is that you can um, you can build up this entire DAG of dependencies and end up with a single feature that represents that entire DAG. Do you have a question? Yeah. So is there, a, is there any order implied in, inside the when all? There is no order implied. The when all just means that the result of the win all is is ready when all of the inputs are ready as well. Okay. okay, so what we get in terms of our final win all is we have dependencies on on all of our fetches and updates. There's no implied ordering in terms of you know which update runs first. It's essentially you know whichever fetch is complete first will end up with those updates happening first. I will observe, however, that there is serialization. There's no specific order, but we did not need to resort to a stood atomic for total. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for bringing that up, uh, Paul. So you'll notice here that there is no explicit synchronization in terms of updating total. One of the things that we'll talk about later is we'll talk about the progress model, but essentially uh, these, these updates do get, do happen, you know, one after the other. So there's no there's no implied ordering, but there is an implied sort of atomicity in terms of only one will actually run at a time, and so therefore we don't need to actually synchronize the this total variable. Yeah. Do we know that the entire uh, uh, callback is going to run without interleaving? I guess we I guess we do. If total is effectively atomic in the local thread. Uh, so, so that's right. A, a callback runs to completion before moving to other callbacks. The full threading model is outside the scope of the tutorial, but there are ways to get some concurrency. By default, these are serialized so that their actions are completely non interleaved. And I'll just briefly mention that if you do want, essentially, if you don't want the full computation to run to completion, you can just launch another. Uh, essentially a local procedure call, which is something that we'll talk about later, you can actually launch one from within a callback. Um, so, so that to have that piece execute later. All right, just, just a quick question to follow up on, on that. That's the par versus seek thread mode in the- That's a piece of it. Personas is the term you would look for in the specification, and that's the full details of the, the threading model. In order to use multiple threads, you do need the, uh, the par backend. The seek backend does not, there are no locks, there's no, uh, but to get the, uh, the full uh, correct and concurrent execution, you'll need to use the personas, which again are outside the scope and the par backend. We will though briefly talk about personas. We're not gonna get into nitty gritty detail, but we will talk about them briefly. All right, so let's, let's actually look at a, uh, another application example, which is a distributed hash table. So it's essentially uh, a distributed analog of stood unordered map, which if you're familiar with that, that's just a hash table. What we'll do is we'll actually divide up our distributed hash table among the processes. Each process will have its own unordered map as its local representative, uh, but then we will um, I mean, chop it up according to according to the key in terms of which uh, process that that key actually lives at. We'll look at insertion and lookup. We'll also do an exercise where we do erase and update. For the purposes of this example, we will use key and value types of string. I alluded to beforehand that we do have uh, serialization that does support strings. So we'll actually. It actually allows us to use string as key value types in RPC. Again, our representation is that each individual process has its own uh, piece of this distributed hash table represented as an, an, an unordered map. And then in order to do an operation, we can be the owner of that particular key and then use an RPC to send it over uh, to the owner to do whatever operation it is, whether that's an insert or a find or an erase or an update. So let's take a look at the data representation. We have our distor map class. And again, for the purposes of simplicity, we will assume string uh, keys and values. You can imagine making this a template instead, but we will keep it simple. 
We will introduce a type alias to make our coding simpler. So a distributed object where each of the individual pieces is an unordered map. We'll refer to that as a dobj map t. Uh, it makes the typing easier. I don't know if it makes the, the verbalization easier, but I will try. So this again is just introducing the type alias. We will have as a member variable of this distro map, a one of these distributed objects uh, to represent each processes local representative of, of, the, of the larger distrib distributed map. Here we are actually initializing it to be an empty map. Um, apologies for those of you who aren't super familiar with C++, but those curly braces are, double curly braces are necessary. The outer curly braces are for the uh, distributed object. The inner curly braces are for the empty unordered map. And then we'll have this get target member function that we'll use to look up the owner for a particular key. And so we'll keep it simple. We'll just compute the hash for the key and then mod it with the number of processes in order to um, determine the owner. Okay, in terms of actually you know, using something like this in an application, you would just need to create a distro map on each of the processes. And that in turn creates this distributed object member variable for each process. Um, and so therefore each process now has a local representative. And then, then you can use the member functions in order to do inserts and finds and other um, hash table operations. So like, let's look at insertion. And again, we would, we would write this as a member function of our distro map. It takes in a key and a value. And like with normal UPC++ operations, we make this asynchronous. So we, we return a feature to represent the completion of this insertion operation. In terms of how it actually works underneath the hood, we use get target rank to compute the, the owner of this particular key and then send over an, an RPC to that, to that process to actually do the insertion. Okay, so in terms of our lab, Lambda object over here, we have our distributed object as our first argument and then we have our key and our value as the, the remaining arguments. Now, I alluded to, to this before, but I will repeat myself here, which is that RPC actually has specific logic for distributed object, where if you have an, an argument that is a distributed object, you give it your representative when you're invoking the RPC, but on the target, it turns into the target's representative for that RPC. So essentially, the RPC logic turns this distributed object into the universal name for that for that distributed object, transfers over the universal name, and then looks up the target's representative um, and passing it to the actual to the actual function as an argument. Okay, so when this when this function actually ends up at the target, it can just do a dereference to obtain its its local unordered map and then index into that as you would um, normally into an unordered map. In terms of invoking the RPC, you pass your own um, representative of the distributed object, and then the name is looked up is used to look up the the target's um, representative when the when the actual RPC function runs. And of course, the rest of the arguments are also provided as as you would normally for an RPC. Okay. Similarly, we can write find in the same way. In this case, our find, the result of our find operation is actually the value associated with that key. So we get a future of string rather than an empty future. As before, we, we send off an RPC to the, to the owner of the key, the owner of the partition that actually includes that key. We use a distributed object as our first argument so that it actually does that, so that it, that translation happens down to universal name and then back to the the local representative on, on the target process. And then we also pass the, the particular key to look up as the argument. The actual code inside of this Lambda function is just is more or less just using an un unordered map. <coughs> the only additional thing is we have a dereference to get from the distributed object to the actual unordered map. So in this case over here, we have the arrow operator uh, to invoke the count member function on that unordered map. 
And a reminder that the error oper operation is the combination of the dereference, the, the star and dot for mem member access. Okay, so the dereference takes us from the distributed object to the unordered map, and then the, the dot gives us the actual member function on that unordered map. Um, we'll just use a not found string to represent something that isn't in that isn't in, in our hash table. You can imagine using something more complicated in other cases, but we'll keep it simple. If it is actually inside of inside of our map, then again, we'll dereference to obtain the unordered map and then index to obtain the value for that key. Yeah, quick question though. Sure. This is more, more on the RPC. So okay, so distributed map is basically translated to the global name on the on the executing side. If I give it a distributed object. As then that's pointing back to the callers. Object, okay, right? so we have distributed object, which is the UPC plus um, plus data type, right. and the distributed map or distur map is what we're building on top of it. Right. So if we actually pass a distributed object, this D object map T is actually a distributed object of um, standard unordered map string string. <coughs> So whenever we pass a distributed object to a um, to an RPC, then it actually undergoes that translation. Okay, so in particular, when local map is passed over here, RPC has logic that that um, that actually sees that this is a distributed object, and so it will translate it rather than transferring this just distributed object. What it does is it pulls out the universal name, sends over the universal name, and then on the remote side. That universal name will get translated to that process's uh, representative of the distributed object. Okay, You're, got got it. And I could send I could send a global pointer, which would then give the remote uh, so the, execution uh, handle the something back on my on the callers. So that is another option in terms of what you can and how you could do this algorithm is that you could store the unordered maps in shared memory rather than private memory. Have global pointers to them, then you have to do the bootstrapping. Maybe you can use a distributed object for that. And then you can send over an RPC which sends the global pointer and then you know dereferences or does dot local on the remote end to obtain the actual um, raw pointer to the unordered map. So absolutely there are many ways to do this. Yeah. Um, so kind of thinking sort of along those lines, can you can you uh, issue RPCs from within RPCs? So the question was, can you issue RPCs from within RPCs? Absolutely, yes, you can. Yeah, so the one big restriction is that you can't do a wait, you can't do a blocking operation from within an RPC, uh, but you can issue new operations. And you can do dot thins and so on because those aren't blocked. All right, so in terms of two more, we've shown you insert and find. There's two more <laughs> operations that are useful for a distributed hash table that we'd like you to uh, try implementing yourselves. So if you open up exercise three, ex3.cpp, you'll see that we have a framework for uh, erase and update. Um, sorry, it's uh, ex3.hpp is where you need to be writing code. The actual uh, distributed map is, is defined within the header file, and then the actual text code, the test code, is in ex3.cpp. So start with erase. You'll be able to run the test code in terms of ex3.cpp with only erase done. It will say erase success if, if it is successful, and then it will crash with an assertion failure. <laughs> Exit it, right? Update. Okay, but that's that's to be that's normal. Um, once you write update, then it will say both erase success and update success. Please pause the video here to work exercise three. All right, so let's go ahead and um, reconvene and take a look at um, at a possible solution for this. So overall, in terms of the logic, it looks a lot like what we saw with find and insert, where um, essentially what we're doing is we're having the owner compete. And so this is one of the nice things that we get out of RPC is that we can send over the computation to the owner to actually do. Um, the other thing that we get out of this, by the way, is something that I didn't mention directly, but you know, we did mention that uh, in terms of the actual RPC functions, they 
they run one at a time on the remote end. So even though we have these things like insertion that are uh, modifying the actual unordered map on the remote end, because the, the actual functions execute one at a time, we don't actually have to put an explicit, explicit synchronization um, in order to get that atomicity. Okay, so what we do is we do an RPC to, to the process that owns this key. We use get target rank to obtain that actual process number. The, the lambda, again, we, we passed our distributed object as an argument. And, you know, we also send it as the argument of the RPC so that this gets translated down to the universal name and then back to the local representative on the other side. And for erase, we just have the key as our other argument. We dereference in order to obtain the actual, the actual unordered map on, that, uh, on the target. So again, L map is the distributed object. The dereference obtains the underlying unordered map. And with the arrow, we get both the dereference and the, the member access in order to obtain the member, the erase member function and invoke it. This RPC doesn't return a value, so the result that we get is an empty feature. So the question was, in terms of RPCs being executed one at a time, is there no multi-threading on the remote? So we do have mechanisms for supporting multi-threading. And we will actually see, um, we'll see in a little while that uh, there is a pattern that you can, you can use in order to get that. Essentially the pattern is that you do an RPC that then enqueues a local procedure call to some other thread. And so then you have those other threads essentially, you know, uh, polling for work to do. So there are mechanisms that we provide that you can actually get that multi-threading on the other hand, but by essentially RPC itself doesn't provide that multi-threading. Okay, so if we look at update, it works the same way, um, except for what we're getting out of update is we're getting the, uh, the old, val old value of associated with the key if it is in there, or, you know, uh, sort of a default value if it isn't. So the end result is actually going to be a string. So if we look at our, our Lambda function that we're invoking, we have, again, our distributed object, we have our key, and then we have our new value. And then we actually wrote this local update function for you that takes in an unordered map. Yeah, we didn't want you mucking around with the, or fighting with the C++ um, more than you have to. <coughs> again, we need to dereference to actually take that, turn that distributed object to the unordered map on that target. And so this uh, star L, L map, um, that dereference is actually necessary to do that. And then we can pass the key and value directly to that local update. It returns the, the old value associated with the key. And we can return that directly inside of our, inside of our Lambda function. Okay, so one of the things I wanna point out is that this distributed hash table isn't a toy example. Now I'll admit that one, the one that, that we did is a toy example, but uh, the, um, the actual abstraction of a distrib distributed hash table is something that's actually used in one of our application codes. Um, in particular, Hitmer uses it. And so you can find in our IPDPS paper from this year that we've actually done some experiments with, with an optimized implementation of this dis distributed hash table and demonstrate that it actually um, scales well um, across a large number of processes. So not only do we get good scalability, but also hopefully as you got a sense of in terms of writing it, we, have, we actually get um, uh, good productivity as well. Now the version that's actually in here um, uses uh, potentially larger keys than we'd want to send, send over directly in an RPC. So essentially the algorithm that it uses is um, use an RPC to allocate a landing zone on, on the owner. And so essentially, our unordered map is now maps a key to a um, to a memory location, and so when we do an insert, it, it allocates that memory location, returns it to the to initiator, which then does a a one sided put to actually store the store the value in that location. Oh, you want to say something? We have a question from the um, from the remote audience. <clears throat> Long one we get from <laughs> clear my throat. Naive question about dist objects and co-arrays. Are you aware of some good reference or survey that contrasts dist objects with data flow distributed collections such as Sparks RDB and Beam's P collection? Certainly the later concepts don't have any awareness about their process alignment 
are lazily evaluated slash need to be explicit materials unachieved, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure who in our group might be qualified to answer to any of those. So open. I think the answer is no, we're not aware of any such reference or survey. Is that correct? Um, I don't think any of us have done that, but maybe it's something that we can do and, and follow up offline. So there is a take home exercise that we don't have time for um, during this tutorial, but you can do on your own. It's um, exercise four, and that's actually using the sort of um, this algorithm of allocating a landing zone and then and then doing a one sided transfer in order to do the movement. And so it's much the exercise is much more similar to what's what's in this paper than um, than what we did in exercise three. All right, so let's uh, let's continue onward. And for the rest of today, we'll actually talk about uh, more advanced EPC++ features, some things that have come up before in terms of, uh, for instance, uh, the progress model, the threading model, and so on. So we kind of deferred discussion of the progress model uh, beforehand when we talked about RPC, but just a reminder in terms of the way an RPC works is that the initiator launches an RPC um, at a particular target that will get enqueued on that target and then run at some later point. Um, when it actually runs at some later point, the, the target will actually send back notification of completion and any return uh, values back to the initiator. So what do we mean by at a later point? This is where the progress model comes in. And so it, it's what ensures that, that RPC actually does eventually get, get executed on the target process so that um, the results get, uh, get fulfilled back on the initiator. So our design principle in terms of design, in terms of building our progress model was that we didn't want to rely on having hidden threads uh, to advance internal state. Okay, because having, having internal threads for this means that we need to now synchronize everything, which means higher overhead, low performance. Okay, we want the runtime to be as lightweight as possible, as, as possible, which means avoiding synchronization wherever possible. So instead, um, as we mentioned before the break, RPCs are actually run uh, one by one on the main thread at the target process. Um, specifically, it's, it's the, the, the thread that we refer to as the master persona. We'll talk about personas more momentarily, but essentially all those RPCs run on that, on that main thread. If there is computation that you want to offload to other processes, the way to do that is, um, is using something called the local procedure call, which we'll also see momentarily. So again, the fact that they are run individually means that in many cases, we don't actually need to do synchronization. So for instance, we didn't need to do synchronization in the distributed hash table case. We didn't need to do synchronization also uh, when it came to um, the pi example where we did the updates. In order for this to work, the runtime relies on the application um, essentially invoking something called progress. Uh, to advance the, the state of the, the UPC++ library. So there's two different levels of progress. There's internal only progress, which advances the internal state, but does not actually notify the application. So this means that internal progress does not run any callbacks. It does not ready any features. Um, and it doesn't uh, invoke any incoming RPCs. Okay, it just merely advances the internal state in, inside the UPC++ library. In order to get everything else that were the things, the things that are application visible, then the application must invoke user level progress. Okay, so it's in user level progress that we actually do things that can be visible to the application, which include readying features, running callbacks, running incoming RPCs, and so on. Questions on sort of the idea of progress before we actually Look at a few more details. Okay, in terms of invoking progress, you can do so explicitly by calling the progress function. And then in fact, you can invoke the progress function to just do internal level progress or give it a different argument to do user level progress as well. However, 
blocking calls such as wait on a future, such as a, a barrier also perform progress as well. So in many cases, you don't actually need explicit calls to progress in order to um, advance the internal states. If, however, you do have a program where you're going into a phase where you say you're doing some long running computation and you're expecting incoming um, RPCs or um, callbacks that you want to be executed, then that means that you need to actually put progress calls inside of that, uh, inside of that long run, running computation. Similarly, if you're spin waiting on, on some flag to be ready, uh, you need to invoke progress explicitly, especially if it's, if it's something, if the flag will only become ready through some incoming RPC, you need to run progress so that that incoming progress, uh, incoming RPC actually gets executed um, to update that flag. As far as what gets executed when you call progress, some number of outstanding callbacks or RPCs that some number can be zero. So that means that um, essentially you need to be calling progress um, regularly to ensure that uh, things do get uh, get processed. If you call it, is there any guarantee as to when it will come back for you? Timing wise? No, there's no guarantee. Um, is there any heuristic that the uh, library uses? No, because you could put a sleep in RPC us violating any bounds I tried to give you. So, like, it depends on what you put in your RPCs. I'm waiting on that. And then if the OS schedules you, I I guess the most concrete thing we can say is we don't arbitrarily delay anything unnecessarily. We try to be reasonable about, like, not going into progress and running a million, if there are a million things waiting in progress, we're not necessarily going to run them all in, in one, well, it's context dependent. I shouldn't go too far with that, John. Um, <laughs> I don't think you'll let me know about a million things. That's a... Maybe we yeah. try hard to be fast. Yeah. But, and, and not block understatement. Yeah. So the summary is what John said at the end, we try hard to be fast. All right, so let's take a look at a specific example where we need to do progress. And again, as I mentioned, in many cases, you don't need explicit calls because you have weights on features or you have barriers that are actually going to be invoking progress. Uh, but in this case, what we've done is we have a boundary ex exchange that is barrier free. And so instead, what it does is um, we, we launch an RPC to actually um, transfer our ghost value but it does both the transfer of the ghost value as well as, uh, you know, toggle a flag to indicate that the data has arrived. So essentially, I'm doing these I'm doing these pushes over to my neighbors of the data as well as the update to the flag to indicate that the data have arrived. And so I'm getting those from my neighbors as well. And so I'm waiting until the flag is ready to indicate that I my incoming data has arrived, and then I can do my computation. If I didn't have this progress, if I just spun with an empty loop over here, then those incoming RPCs would never ever execute. Okay, but by calling progress, that ensures that when they do arrive, that progress call does actually invoke the incoming RPC, which will then, you know, copy over the data to, to its destination as well as toggle the flag, and therefore allowing me to exit this, uh, this spin waiting loop. Okay. So again, this is, this is a barrier-free uh, boundary exchange that does require progress calls to ensure that uh, the incoming RPCs get pro processed and the, uh, and the process can actually proceed. All right, I will also point out here that again, when we talk about um, RPCs being processed, we say that they only they get processed in serial one at a time, right? And so essentially we know that when this RPC arrives, it's actually going to run it to the, the function to completion, which means that it will both modify the value as well as set the flag. And so we don't actually need any explicit synchronization here to ensure that they happen atomically. That being said, this does involve the CPU. And there are many cases where you want to do remote atomics that don't actually involve the CPU if your network hardware supports it. 
So UPC++ also has support for remote atomics. We've designed it in such a way to essentially make the best use of the, the hardware capabilities. So essentially the idea is that you construct a domain over a set of the operations that you need um, to be supported for this domain. And of course you want to pick, you know, the minimum set that you need and the, the runtime automatically checks to see is this set of operations something that is supportable directly in the network hardware? If so, it will use the network hardware's atomic capability and not involve the remote CPUs. But if there's some specific atomic operation, so, so for instance, if I need this set of operations, but it so happens that my hardware doesn't support fetch and adds, then the UPC++ library will instead um, use the CPU for this atomic domain to ensure that everything is actually does happen atomically. Okay, so you specify an atomic domain over a set of operations and we do our best to ensure that, you know, in the cases where it can be supported in the network hardware, we use the network hardware, otherwise we, otherwise we use the CPU. And then you use that domain to actually do these operations on global pointers. And of course, as is normally the case with atomics, if you have a piece of memory that you're using atomics with, you can't, you shouldn't be accessing it with non-atomic operations at the same time, uh, because then those results are undefined. Right, one more thing I'll mention before proceeding, they are atomics, but they're still not synchronous. So you still get a future back. Okay. And so in this case over here, we see we did a fetch add on this pointer over here and a fetch add you know, the fetch part of it actually gives us back um, the old value. So we, we have a future that actually encodes that old value inside of it as well. Okay, a few details about serialization. We alluded to it earlier, but again, here in, in terms of serialization, what we mean is converting in-memory representation of objects to their byte representations, uh, specifically in the case of UPC++ to be transferred as part of an RPC. So RPCs themselves support serialization. We have several different um, forms of serial serialization that we support right now. It's primarily things that are trivially copyable. So just where the in-memory representation is exactly the same as the, as the byte representation. However, we have a work in progress um, generalization of this for user-defined serialization as well. Okay, so for now what we have is we can support anything that is uh, C compatible as well as most standard library containers as long as their elements are also um, C compatible types. Okay, so this includes vector, it includes string, which is why the distributed hash table that we did worked. We sent RPCs with the key and value as string. And so the RPC did the right thing in order to do the serialization as part of the transfer and then the deserialization um, on the remote target. Now, one of the things that to be careful of when doing serialization is to understand that it does involve, involve some copying. Okay, so we have on, on the initiator, we have a translation from, from the in-memory representation to the, to the byte representation, and that gets sent over the wire. And then on, on the target, if I'm sending a vector int, I get back a vector of it, which means it needs to get deserialized and then stored in a vector somewhere. And so that actually entails a copy from the network level buffer to the whatever the memory is for the vector. Okay, so this is sort of nice programmatically, but it isn't necessarily ideal in terms of performance. So what we have is we have, in addition to this, we have a non-owning view that we provide as well, which avoids doing that extra copy. Okay, so in this case, instead, what I can do is if I have a vector of int, I can, in this case, a vector of float, I can construct a view over that and send that to RPC instead. And on the other end, we won't actually get back a vector of float, we will also get back a view. But it will be a view over, instead of, um, instead of the memory of a vector, it'll be a view over the network buffer itself. Okay, so avoiding that copy from network buffer into an external vector somewhere. And if our 
if the function that we're sending over in RPC, if it just can consume the items directly in that uh, in that function call, then I can actually avoid that that additional memory copy and and uh, result in better performance. Okay, but again, you have the option of either. You can either just serialize the send the vector directly, in which case it does get copied into um, into a mem uh, into memory for a vector that can live on however long, however much you need it to live on. But if you only need the data for the duration of the actual RPC function, then you can use a view and then operate on the data directly uh, through that view. Yeah. Uh, question from the chat. What about support for formats such as protobuf? Would the overhead be so large as to render this undesirable in this context? Do we need to ask what protobuf is because it doesn't ring a bell to me? That's, pretty much, that's, that's Google's way of serializing the bytes. Okay. And it is, it's fairly efficient, but it compresses. So like it won't encode zero bytes for like an integer, an eight byte integer typically is all zeros after it increases it. So for a buffer like scan that and only encode meaningful bytes. Uh, the overheads would probably be quite noticeable in HPC context, but I haven't measured that, so I'm just adding an example. Um, I do know that there are codes out there that have looked at taking uh, the redundancy in large floating point arrays, where, for instance, there's a very small range of uh, exponents, and so the upper eight or more bytes are, are the same across every eight byte quantity and, and using um, some, some compression that is sensitive to the fact that it's floating point data, certainly truncating some of the mantissa bits from floating point uh, is unimportant for some algorithms. So I would say that there is proof in the HPC space that at least with MPI, that packing and unpacking with some compression logic can certainly not uniformly is, but can be beneficial. So uh, I would say it depends. I, I, you know, if your data, if you're just spending overhead for data that doesn't compress, obviously it's not a known benefit. The fact that we do work hard to overlap and get asynchrony may actually help help hide some of that potentially, but there's only so many CPU centers that we gotta go somewhere. So I think perhaps the more maybe um, at least my interpretation of the question that's being asked is, do we interoperate with protobufs? Like if the user has made the decision that the, the overhead of the compression and decompression is worth it, uh, is that something that we can support? Right, so in that context, as long as it can be converted to a byte array and extracted from a byte array at the other end, or in three months from now, as long as you can write something that does something semantically equivalent to that with our serialization, Folks, then yes, it would be supported. But the doesn't the overhead question. I think all we can say is it depends. I know it's not an ideal answer. Could you review again? When would I not want to use a view? And when when would I pass the? So if you need to make a copy anyway, say that um, say I need to send over a vector somewhere else and it needs to be stored somewhere. Um, in that case. You know, we're not going to just be consuming it within the RPC itself. It may be useful just to s send it over with a regular RPC and then move it into wherever it needs to be. Okay. So I think John probably has better answers to that. That's accurate. Yeah, if the container needs to outlive the uh, RPC function, and it doesn't, matter. I mean, you could send a view and build the container, or you could let the runtime build the container because it's going to just keep surviving. So I could, I could move, I could move it out of it if I send the vector, but not if I send the view. Basically. Well, if you send the view, you'd have to build it yourself. Okay. And you get probably roughly the same performance curve. Okay. Yeah, so the summary for those of you, in case those of you on the Zoom didn't catch John's answer, is that if essentially if the container needs to outlive the RPC, then it makes sense to send it directly in the RPC. Um, you could use a view and build it, build the container yourself. You'll get roughly the same performance, at, but doing the work that RPC already does for you. So from a programmatic standpoint, it's not, not very well motivated to do it that way. So, so the question, view here is just a vector, but without the copy, is it always a vector or can T be arbitrary? So there's a lot of subtlety in terms of what, how T affects things. 
Um, it turns out that this is true for, in terms of it being a direct view over a network buffer, it's true for T that it is uh, what we refer to as trivially serializable. So essentially that's just byte copied. If they are complicated T's, then it is not AV over the network buffer. But it's, is it always a vector or? Yeah, I'd like to give a different answer. So the make view call there is being called over a vector of floats. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a vector. It can be any container. In fact, it can be any begin and end iterators can be passed into make view. There, there's overloads of make view that take begin and end forward iterators. Yeah, the view itself is just two iterators eliminating an order sequence. Yeah. Um, yeah, my apologies. Is, um, I think I may have answered the wrong question. But yeah, in terms of constructing a view, it can be over any sequence. Uh, but in terms of what you get back out of the RPC, and in the cases where we can where we can actually accomplish it, you end up with a view over over a contiguous network buffer. But in more complicated cases, uh, that wouldn't be the case. Okay, another thing that we've alluded to before in terms of um, you know we've talked about allocating something in in your shared segment and then converting it down to a just a raw C plus plus pointer in order to um, access it directly through load store. Uh, this isn't something that is only applicable to memory that you allocated. If I have, you know, my neighbor in process and I know that they, we actually share physical memory, then, you know, it makes sense for me to actually access their data through raw C++ pointers as well. Okay, so in general, memory systems are hierarchical, not just two levels, not in just terms of local versus remote, but there's also intermediate levels as well. And so UPC++ specifically adds an intermediate level for processes that actually are on the same node that share memory. Local team is, we haven't really talked about um, subset teams, but it is something that we support. We have a built-in local team that you can use to obtain the set of processes that actually uh, share memory with you. And so that tells you this is a set of processes for which it's actually okay for me to take one of their global pointers and cast it down to a, a raw C++ pointer. So in this picture down here, we have four different processes across two nodes. These uh, green squares are actually node boundaries. And so if I'm on process zero over here, which apologies if that process zero is cut off on the zoom, but it says process zero at the bottom. Now, I can access my own shared seg segment directly through raw C++ pointers, but I can also access memory in my, in process one's shared segment as well, because again, we're on the same node and we share memory. So one of the things that we can actually do with this is we can actually build our data structure so that we reduce the amount of replication that we need. Instead of having one copy per process, we can have one copy per uh, shared memory domain, okay, per node. So down here we have a representation of this. Okay, so here I have um, essentially a two element array for my two processes, but rather than, have, than having process zero just have its own element in its own array, process one have its own element in its own array. Instead, I'm storing them in a single two element array in the memory, in the shared segment for process zero. And then process zero and process one both have raw C++ pointers to that, to that memory. Okay, similarly processes two and three, which also share memory, um, have a, a single data structure uh, for both of them. Okay, so the way to accomplish that, or one way to accomplish that is I use local team to obtain my rank in the, uh, in the local team. So in the case of process zero, uh, their rank in the local team is zero. Process one, its rank is one. Process two in its local team is also rank zero. And then process three is rank one in, that in, in its local team. Okay, so I can use local team to obtain my rank as well as the number of processes within that local team. And then I can have process zero within the team so the team representative whose rank is zero do the actual allocation in its own memory. And in this case, I'm allocating one element per process. So my, my count in terms of the number of processes I have in my local team is the size of the data that I'm allocating. Uh, 
And then I can, I can do that allocation again on rank zero in my team and then send it out using a broadcast to all the other members of that team. Okay, so now at this point, all the processes within the team have GPE data pointing at the same um, memory location with a, um, here it's a, it's a global pointer, but we can actually turn that down into just a raw C++ pointer. Uh, because we know that that came from another process with which um, with which we share memory. Okay, and then once we have just a raw C++ pointer, we can use um, just C++ syntax to actually uh, index into it. Okay, there are several things that we've actually accomplished with by doing this. Essentially, the first thing is that we can avoid replication. So if I have, say, I'm, I'm running on a Xeon Phi with 272 threads per node, and I have some data structure that everyone needs access to, I don't need 272 copies. Instead, I can just have a single copy on, on one of those processes, and then you know, essentially broadcast this pointer, have them downcast it to get, uh, to get those local pointers all to that single copy. Okay, so this allows us to optimize our memory usage um, to avoid replication um, where we can. Other things that we get out of this is that, again, we can use a raw C++ pointer to represent, to refer to something that's located in the shared segment of whatever, my neighboring process, which means that I don't need to go through the network to, to actually um, to read that data. I can just use a direct load, loader store. So that means that I'm also avoiding communication as well uh, by, by optimizing for this, uh, for this shared memory hierarchy. Questions on this? Yeah, the UDP conduit understands this as well. Uh, yeah, no question. I'm not sure what you mean by understand it. Yes, so when we spawn with, uh, it's not dependent on the network, the way the processes are set up, we'll be using something, depending what's available, POSIX shared memory or system five shared memory to allow the memory shared among the processes to be map cross map into different processes the communication mechanism actually is what optimizes that with very few exceptions that are probably not worth discussing okay um, so briefly in terms of threading model again this is something that we've touched upon in the past but essentially the design goal for UPC++ was to be agnostic to the specific thread model and so instead what we've done is we, we packaged up the internal UPC++ per thread state into an abstraction called a persona. So when you actually, if you have a, a program that actually has multiple threads per process, each one gets its a default persona that it owns forever, but then you, the application can actually create its own personas as well. And then pass them, pass ownership from one thread to another to actually pass that state uh, between threads. We also, for each process, construct um, something that we refer to as the master persona. And this is the one that actually runs those incoming RPCs. And again, the master persona is not the same thing as a default persona. It's an additional one um, that is created and assigned to a particular thread in the process. And again, because it is not the default one, this can also be passed around to other threads. Okay, so at some point I can pass ownership from one thread um, to another thread if I want to. Let me actually show you a particular use case which, which um, requires one additional thing which is LPC or local procedure call, but essentially our mechanism for actually invoking computation on some other thread. And again, what we actually, this is actually a member function of a persona, so it's whoever, whichever thread owns that persona at the current moment is the one that's actually going to execute it. And so one particular way of using this is I have my, my thread that, my master thread that owns the master persona is the one that actually does communication. So here we're doing a large argget and then attaching a callback to that, which will actually do an LPC to a particular worker thread to actually process the results of that, uh, of that transfer. Okay. So that's what my master thread is doing and assume it's doing a bunch of these maybe two different threads. So what my worker threads are doing is 
they obtain ownership of that worker persona. And persona scope is just a, a C++ RAII um, mechanism for obtaining ownership of that persona within this particular scope. And then essentially my worker thread can just sit there and call progress. Okay. And when it gets an incoming LPC and it and it's in the middle of progress, it's actually going to invoke, uh, do that computation and then sit back and wait. Okay, so essentially the pattern over here is we have our master thread um, is in queuing work on our worker threads and our worker threads are sitting there waiting for work to come in and then processing. Okay, in so far we've only talked about in terms of handling asynchrony, we've talked about features. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about things like attaching callbacks to features. However, the UPC++ actually supports several different mechanisms for actually, um, for actually in queuing work as a result of, of an asynchronous operation. And also for a specific operation, there's more than one event associated with that. Okay, so for instance, if I have a vector put over to some, from some of my memory over to somebody else's memory, there's some point, at, at, there's some point of time in which the library is done using the source memory and then I can go ahead and, you know, modify it or deallocate it. Right? And that's not necessarily the same point of time as when the entire transfer as a whole is completed. You know, as soon as, soon as the library has injected all the data in the network, then, then I can reuse the buffer. But that doesn't necessarily mean that all the data has arrived and been processed at the remote end. Okay, so in general, we have multiple different events that happen for an operation. There's event when the source data is able to be reused. There's an event that signifies the entire operation is complete. And one of the interesting things that we'll get back to in a couple of moments is that there's also the event in terms of the data arriving at the remote side. So we can actually attach some remote computation to that event as well. All right, so we have several different notification events for an operation, and then we have several mechanisms for working with that notification event. The default is we get back a future and then we do a wait on it to determine whether or not it had completed. But we also have other mechanisms as well. So for instance, we can enqueue a local procedure call to, to, to execute when that operation completes. Um, we'll talk about promises in a moment, which allows us to do um, essentially counting um, how many operations have completed. And we'll also talk about, in, again, um, in queuing some work on the remote side as well, essentially doing an RPC along with our transfer. Okay, so there's lots of different forms of, of completion that we support beyond just features and beyond just the entire operation having completed. Okay, so let's look at promises as an example. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with C++ promises and futures, essentially in, in the C++ abstraction, future is the consumer end. Um, it's, it's essentially where the data arrives and where the notification that the data completed has arrived. And promise is the, cons is the producer end. Okay, it's where we actually, you know, place the, the results of the operation or the notification that the operation has completed. So typically speaking by default, if I invoke a UPC++ asynchronous operation, the promise is actually internal to the library. Okay, so if I do an, an R put for instance, internally it allocates a promise and then it will fulfill that promise when the operation is completed. And so I get back the feature, the consumer end that's associated with that promise. However, I can instead create my own promise and then pass it uh, to an operation so that it actually essentially um, uses that as the producer for, for that operation. Okay, so this example over here does exactly that. We create a promise and then we attach a bunch of different RMA operations to this and we have a syntax for essentially providing um, the promise as, as the producer end of that. Here where the, the actual event that we want is completion of the entire operation. So that's where the operation CX comes from. 
then after we've actually attached each of these operations to the promise, we can we can close registration and obtain an actual future. And then that future will be ready when all of those operations are completed. Okay, so instead of building a big DAG like we did um, in the Pi case, we can just use a promise and attach several different operations to that promise and then obtain a future that represents completion of all of those operations. Is there, a, is there an advantage to this over the, the DAG of uh, compiled futures or is this just syntactically smoother? So there's, I would say there's two advantages. One is the syntax. The other one is that it's less chasing of dependencies down in the runtime. So it's essentially we, what we get out of here is we flattened out the, uh, the dependency the, um, representation. Okay, so another particularly interesting use case of our completion mechanism is I mentioned that you can actually enqueue some remote work that happens when the transfer completes. And so this allows us to do what we refer to as a signal input, which is I can do a put and then um, some remote computation that actually gets invoked when, that, when the data have been transferred. Okay, so here I'm transferring data from some source to some destination. And then I'm attaching this callback to that transfer so that this computation happens after that transfer is completed. Okay, so you can also imagine a boundary exchange where like we looked at one where we had to, um, where we're setting a flag, right? You can do that with this, uh, this as RPC completion as well. Okay, but it also can be some larger computation that just use the results of that transfer. Now I'll mention that we get something that kind of looks like message passing in terms of that we're doing both a transfer and some sort of synchronization as well. But this is still one sided. This, the initiator provides everything, including, you know, the metadata in terms of the source and the target des, uh, memory addresses, as well as the computation to be done on the remote. Yeah. But the completion is not one sided, right? The data transfer is one sided, but. The computation happens whenever progress is invoked on the target. Yeah, so that's where the target actually gets involved. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't need to know that it's getting this particular message. It just, it's just a call to progress. Other questions? So there is no indication of synchronization. It doesn't happen immediately after that. They just enqueue some work. That's right, it enqueues work. So a couple more um, features I just want to mention briefly, um, and you know we don't have time to go into detail on this, but uh, there is a UPC++ specification, and of course we're going to be around to answer questions and we can talk at length, how, at however much length you want on these advanced features. Uh, but we do support um, not non-CPU memory or non-host memory. Uh, in particular, right now we have support for um, transfers of CUDA based GPU memory, and we support any combination of local or and remote host or GPU memory. The other thing that I wanted to give you a pointer to was um, non contiguous transfers. So, you know, we looked at the 1D stencil case, we have multi dimensional case. Um, for most of your neighbors, it's not actually going to be contiguous. So, you can do the packing yourself. Or you can have us do the packing for you. And we we support three different granularities in terms of trading off the amount of metadata versus the generality. So we have the most general, which is just a set of iterators over pointers and length. We have an intermediate one, which is iterators over pointers, but with a fixed length. And then we have the most restricted case, which is um, strided. So this is a case where if you had a dense grid, and you were doing a boundary exchange, you could do it with Strided. And that you know, takes up the least metadata, likely to be the most efficient pack in exchange for being suited to that restricted case. Questions on non-contiguous RMA or memory time? So, so basically, the other series of our RMA that you instantiate 
So in terms of how this gets implemented under the hood, not necessarily. So essentially, I think in, in most cases, essentially the library does the packing and does a single transfer? Uh, well, there, there's some heuristics you use. Dan could probably explain to someone in detail offline if they, if they want the, the details, but we have different protocol choices to the characteristics of different networks in terms of how we pack things. If they're long continuous runs, those are the RMAs. If it's a lot of small data, we'll tend to pack it up into uh, into buffers of a presumably optimal or, or nearly optimal size. But it also automatically pipelines things when it's packing. So it, it doesn't just naively pack everything and then send it. It packs one flit worth of data and sends it so that that gets overlapped with packing the next chunk and so on. So I think I think the summary is that it's complicated and GasNet handles the complication rather than the application developer. All right, we are at the end of our time and also at the end of our um, prepared materials. So I just wanted to give you pointers for everything else. So again, here I've repeated the link for the tutorial materials, but also everything else is available at upcxx.lbl.gov. Um, thank you all for attending and for all your wonderful questions. We can continue to answer questions and we have it, but we also don't want to obligate anyone to stay either. I'd like to ask everybody to put their hands together and thanks to our presenter. Uh, Rosetta, Rebecca, uh, and oh, actually Ozni is still here, um, uh, who contributed greatly to uh, the logistics of making this happen. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, the entire team who has put a lot of work over the last several weeks and months into making this all happen. Thank you, everybody.